Good morning. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, so today is, um, this I don't know, this might be our ninth or tenth. I'm not sure how many climate symposiums we've done, but welcome to our 19, or 19, 2017 Climate Symposium. My name is Robin Lyshenko, and I'm the co-director of the Climate Institute. I also want to welcome you on behalf of my other half co-director, uh, Tony Broccoli, as well as our associate director, Marjorie Kaplan. Um, so today we're doing cities and climate change. We, we have a different theme every year, and we always encourage, actually, folks to make suggestions for themes for the future. So please have your thinking cap on about next year. Um, so today, for today's symposium, we deliberately included the tagline, wherever the world is going, cities will get there first. Now, this is a nod to, for the old-time New Jerseyans in the room, um, the, mayor, the former mayor of Newark, Kenneth Gibson, somewhat, something like 40 years ago, had a, had a tagline about Newark that wherever American cities are going, Newark will get there first. And so we're sort of nodding to, you know, sort of the history of, of New Jersey, but um, we're also kind of thinking about in terms of the idea of cities and where cities are taking us with emissions and where cities are also taking us in terms of climate change solutions. And so that's sort of our broader theme for today. And with that, let me, um, oh, just also I need to, th I need to acknowledge our, the Frank Spasanta Memorial Endowment, which um, provided a generous donation that, that makes our sort of symposium possible. And um, also I need to acknowledge our planning committee. So we had um, Serpal Gurren, Jeannie Herb, uh, Marjorie Kaplan, and of course Kai Wan Win as our organizers. So with that, let me introduce um, Bob Goodman as our sort of generous sponsor and continual supporter of the Climate Institute. Good morning, everybody. So, um, through um, sign language, uh, Tony Broccoli and I have just exchanged uh, confirmation that this is, in fact, the 10th. Uh, so here we are a decade in, and we've forgotten how long it's been already. <laughs> uh, so the first one, which I remember well, uh, grew out of a conversation that Tony and Alan and several others had, as I recall, walking around the loop of Lippman Drive up near Martin Hall in which um, we came to the shared realization that this university and New Brunswick in particular had a remarkable collection of people who were interested in climate issues and we didn't really have a climate program. And from that came uh, the idea of an ongoing symposium and from that also came uh, the formation eventually of the, uh, well actually right away, of the Rutgers Climate Institute. So congratulations and thanks to the faculty leadership and to the students and staff who have been supportive and interested in this area. As far as the question of whether, whether the world is going, cities will get there first, there's gonna be a lot of competition for getting there first. We have crossed the line, as most of you know, of 50% urbanized populations on the globe. It's over 70%, over maybe 80% in the US. Um, we're gonna add a few more billion people to the Earth's population and if current trends continue, uh, that much of that population increase will be urban, then I've done the simple calculation that roughly 200 new 5 million or is it 6 million person cities are going to have to happen, or the existing cities, which will be a combination of both, I'm sure, will continue to grow at an unparalleled, unprecedented pace. So urbanization is a huge issue, and of course many of the urban centers of the world 
are located close to mean sea level. So we have our work cut out for us as a civilization, as a population, and as a scientific community to deal with this uh, because it comes with a whole range uh, of other uh, related big issues. John Muir will never be more right than he will be in the 21st century uh, with the remark that he's attributed um, that everything is connected to everything else. So it's a welcome, it's, a, it's an honor for me to welcome you to this event um, and particularly uh, to welcome home, as I said to her, uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig, who is a graduate of, uh, of Rutgers. Um, let's see, when you were a student, it was Cook, right? And um, uh, Cynthia studied soil science here. Uh, we were exchanging fond stories of John Tedrow, uh, who um, she knew earlier in his career, and I knew uh, right at the end. Um, uh, Cynthia, I actually have a set of books, uh, notebooks of Ted Rose that he came and brought, gave to me um, uh, a couple of years ago for safekeeping. Uh, and they go back to the 1890s and early 1900s, uh, recording um, the history of soils and geology, which of course at Rutgers started with George Hamill Cook, after whom the Cook campus is named. He was the state geologist in the 1860s. So Cynthia is not only a world-renowned scientist, um, um, but a Rutgers alum, agricultural science, master's I guess it was in soils and crop science. Uh, the Cook Community Alumni Association honored her uh, a couple of years ago with the Dennis M. Fenton Distinguished Graduate Alumni Award. Uh, and, um, and she worked in the, in the Pinelands. Mediterranean subclover to see if it could grow in New Jersey and showed that whether climate change would affect native crops undoubtedly influenced her work on climate change and she's gone on to be an international leader in the area of climate a science. So uh, we're getting started a little late. Maybe I'll uh, truncate uh, my prepared remarks, for which thank you, Marjorie. Um, the, uh, the day is full of great stuff, and, um, and we're going to start with uh, at the top, which is with Cynthia. So um, Robin, I think you will introduce Cynthia, if I haven't done enough already. <laughs> So thanks, everyone. And um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig. Cynthia is a senior research scientist and climate impacts group lead at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. So Cynthia is not just the co-chair of the New York City panel on climate change, but she's also chaired multiple national inter and international assessments on climate change for the US Global Change Research Program, the IPCC, the United Nations Sustainable Development Network, and she's also been widely recognized for her contributions to science, not simply what um, was already mentioned by Dean Goodman, but she was also named journal, the, one of Journal Nature's top 10 people who mattered in 2012 for her work preparing New York City for climate extremes. She's a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, and she, in her, in her work, she joins impact models with climate models to look at future outcomes of climate change for land use, agriculture, and other um, earth systems. And urban areas. <laughs> as well as urban areas, which we'll hear about today. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you, Marjorie Kaplan and Robin Lachenko, very much. Um, as uh, Dean Goodman said, I'm an alumna of Cook, so it's always just really great to come back. Um, come come back here down. You know, I'm 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 originally from uh, the New York metropolitan region, so it's great to come back to this part of the New York metropolitan region. Um, also, because and this is what I really want us to think about together today, is this concept of the metropolitan region and how we can 
uh, build on the great work here in New Jersey and the work that's going on in New York and have there be more collaboration, I think. Um, the, a lot of the work on climate change gets uh, siloed, right? Of course, each place is unique and, and every place has to work on its own uh, issues. But, um, but at the same time, when we think about this regional aspect with the 20, over 20 million people, as opposed to the eight and a half million people just in the five boroughs of New York, and New Jersey playing such a key role in the region, let's think together today about how we can build uh, the cooperation. Because I guess I have a concern that if, um, it's a, sometimes it's called the jack-o'-lantern effect, that some areas and regions are really prepared for, let's say, a particular set of climate change scenarios, and then maybe right next door, those folks didn't get protected for some region. It's a little bit like the barriers. The barriers will, will protect some people, but not others. So it's, I think, let's, um, what I hope to share, as I'm sharing some of the uh, larger contexts, uh, as well as what we do in New York, of climate change in cities and cities as first responders. Let's think together about how we can scale up and scale in and scale deeper so that our entire metropolitan region can truly respond to climate change. Now, let's see if this works. So here we are, it's much easier to read here. Um, and let's see if I have a pointer. No, not a pointer, that's okay. Um, let's first go to, let's first um, move over to another city right now, Bonn in Germany, and we all know what's happening. Ah, here's the pointer, fantastic. Okay, so all of the countries of the world are there, including our own, and are discussing the progress on the Paris Agreement, which is the landmark treaty on climate change. Um, and this is the actual language in the Paris Agreement that includes cities. Now, we now have, up here are the parties with a capital P, and that's what the nation states call themselves, the countries call themselves the parties, because they are the parties to the actual agreement. But this time, after about really a couple of decades or at least 10, 15 years of the city's um, uh, networks and political groups fighting and fighting and fighting to get the countries who were negotiating the, what became eventually the Paris Agreement, they finally got cities actually explicitly into the agreement. This took, it took years and years and years. And just, you can see, the parties have the capital P, the cities have a small C. Because it's hard for the nation states to really get on board with the important role of cities as first responders. So why is it that we say cities are first responders? And uh, the reason is that when you look at the two major responses to climate change, I'm sure you all know, mitigation in terms of reducing greenhouse gas, uh, the constant atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases, and adaptations city, uh, in terms of responding to the climate changes that are already occurring and are projected to uh, increase in the future. On both of these major responses, cities are leading the way. So first of all, in terms of mitigation. Maybe I'll go over here. Then I can, it's a little easier to see it. Okay, so here we have the, this is one example to show you, uh, that, you know, to prove to you that this is indeed the case. So here we have the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. This was established in June 2016, bringing together lots of the different networks from Europe um, and uh, from other places around the world to have cities pledge reductions in greenhouse gases. So in this global covenant, it is now over 7,000 cities that have done this pledging. Now, 
This is a lot more than the 190 plus countries that have signed, signed the Paris Agreement. And when you look at the actual amounts, you can see um, over 120 countries, six continents, 600 million inhabitants. Bob was just talking about population increase. And they, make, they are pledging each city uh, specific pledges uh, to, for reduction of greenhouse gases. Now, in this regard, what I think is very striking is that when the countries then took on and developed their Paris Agreement, they actually took the city's approach, which was city by city making individual city commitments to reduce greenhouse gases. And this is exactly what finally worked in getting the Paris Agreement that each country created their own nationally determined commitments. NDCs, I'm sure you've probably heard that. The, the countries finally adopted the city's approach and they, got, they were finally able to get the Paris Agreement. So I would say that is very, very definitively cities leading the way. Now, in terms of adaptation, here's a map of the projections and the, the climate modelers in the world are very familiar with, in the room, are, are very familiar with this kind of map, um, which shows um, for a mean of, uh, of global climate model projections in the 2050s, what the temperature changes will be around the world. Now mostly, uh, these, have, uh, these maps have been created either with just the continental landmass boundaries and the oceans, or with the nation states, with the country boundaries on it. But for the first time, cities actually then are, are displayed here. This is something that the work of our network, Urban Climate Change Research Net Network, actually did. Because for a long time, it was all about, well, what's going to happen to ecosystems, or what's going to happen to food supply? I've done a lot of work on that, too. But actually, where is, going to, is climate change going to affect people the most? They're going to, it's going to affect people in the cities where they live. And now, over, as Bob said, of course, we all know, over half the people in the world now live in cities. So one of the things that we do in our work is we create climate projections downscaled, or sometimes that's called right-scaled, um, so that we can really look and help cities begin to prepare for what temperature projections they're giving, that they may be facing, what precipitation changes, and of course, sea level rise for coastal cities. So why is it that city leaders are at the right level to take action? I think it's very important that we ask ourselves this question because it really then, so it's to understand, well, why is this happening that cities are being the first responders? So I think that there are a number of reasons. First, cities have more direct contact with their constituents. So, for example, what happens when there's an, a disaster in a city? Let's say a big hurricane, like we had with Hurricane Sandy. What do the national leaders do? They helicopter in, and they helicopter out. In the city leaders are there on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with the problems. So that they're the ones who are really on the front lines with the actual citizens who are being affected. Now, uh, similar to that, city leaders are involved in day-to-day -day management. Um, in this regard, there's a great quote that Mayor Bloomberg and took, I think, from Mayor LaGuardia um, about picking up the garbage. And this is, the quote is, there is no Democrat or Republican way to pick up the garbage. So you see, cities just have to roll up their sleeves and solve the problems. Now, another thing that we've found very, that I, that's striking is that the cities have been able to form coordination networks uh, with each other. And so this is in sharp contrast to the over two decades that the countries, getting back to that Paris Agreement, took to, to come to the agreement uh, uh, for solving, for, for the global solution to climate change. The countries just weren't able to get together. 
the way that the cities are clearly able to do. They just, cities can, can get it. They don't feel threatened by other cities. They just, they say, we want to learn how you're doing it. We want to share information. We want to, you know, get the best, just the best ideas. And they just steal shamelessly from each other. It's like the bus rapid transit from Curitiba, Brazil. It's a very good example of that. So that's why we, I, this is some of the reasons why that city leaders are at this right level and are the cities are being the first responders. So let's turn to our own region here and this metropolitan region approach, which I really believe is so important that we have to work harder on. So what we do in New York with the New York City Panel on Climate Change is we uh, do downscale climate projections that are roughly good for a 100-mile radius because uh, that's you know, about the size of the grid boxes from coming from the GCMs now. Um, but when we look within the region, in particular for sea level rise, and that's these three here, while, some of the, while the Connecticut uh, increase um, in the, the tide gauges are showing that uh, a, a fairly similar increase to uh, the New York sea level rise, you guys here in New Jersey are having significantly uh, higher, double the rate. So clearly, it can't be a one-size-fits-all in terms of the projections. So what we now in the New York City Panel on Climate Change are doing, along with folks um, who, and would like to do more, along with folks who have started the Climate Adaptation Network, is really start working together with the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance, and I think many of you are part of that um, uh, here, and what you all are doing for New Jersey, and what the Connecticut folks at University of Connecticut are doing, so that we can all come together, because we also don't want to confuse the public and say, well, in New York, these are the projections, and, and, but in New Jersey, these are the projections. But taking, while, while we have to recognize there, there are some reasons for it, why those might be different. But some kind of coordinated approach, I think, will really help to make sure that the entire metropolitan region is protected and preparing. So just to share a little bit about how New York does, has been responding to, for climate, to, to climate change. And this has been since uh, 2008. And some of the reasons why in New York, all in all, while there's bumps along the road, there in general New York City has been a leader of cities, not just in the United States, but worldwide in responding to climate change. So here are some of the elements that I think and we think in the NPCC are the reason why that is. What does, what does a city need to do or a, city, a metropolitan region need to do to ha, do actually respond to the, these very uh, big challenges, significant challenges? So the first thing is you need leadership. So we had that in New York under Mayor Bloomberg who started the, the, uh, the response efforts. Uh, and we now have that with Mayor de Blasio, a continuation of that leadership. So someone in charge has to say, yes, this is important. We need to do this and lead. The second thing is there needs to be coordination. That's why the Climate Alliance, I think, that you have is really also is comparable to, in, in the case of New York, there's the citywide office, part of the government, of the city government, which is the uh, citywide office of recovery and resilience. Um, and then you need to coordinate the folks who are managing the critical infrastructure uh, systems, for example. So, you know, all of these, look at this, energy, transportation, social infrastructure, water, waste and sewer, telecommunications, all of these sectors will be um, impacted by the climate change, some, perhaps in some cases are already being, being affected, and they have to prepare their own sector, but also you need to do it in a coordinated way because of the interdependencies across, for example, if the, uh, energy, if the electricity goes out, then all of the systems, including the transportation, especially the transport, besides the energy and the electricity, then the transportation goes out, the water goes out, and this, this response, besides being unique to the different sectors, also has to be Co coordinated and responding to interdependencies. Right? 
So in New York, we have a stakeholder task force um, called the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force. And they are the implementers of the folks who actually have to get things done to, do, to respond to climate change. Another th th part that, um, that um, New York has uh, in its structure of response are the experts, scientists, and researchers. And I think many of you here in this room are, are from this community. And here, this expert panel called the New York City Panel on Climate Change, and Bill Selecki and I are the co-chairs of it. University scholars, public sector so scholars, private sector experts all come together and provide the climate risk information for the entire city. That's why it's coordinated across uh, such the, but this is, it's primarily focused on the five boroughs. Now, one good thing, which I think I didn't put on the slide, but it's very important, is that the city council passed a law, Local Law 42, that the New York City panel had to provide this information not just once, right? A lot of cities just have these one-off climate change reports, right, which are great. But what actually cities need is an ongoing series of assessments as, one, the climate is changing, right? And as our information and understanding of the climate improves. And so, but you can't be, and, but it can't be every single paper, peer-reviewed journal paper that comes out, because the, the, the city's decision makers, their heads are spinning. They're going, I, what can we do with this? Should we respond to this new paper, or this new Jim Hansen paper, my former boss, or this new you know, Bob Cop paper, for example. But what the, by, by having this kind of panel and an ongoing assessment process, then we're providing a set of projections that for the city to work with on the order of about four years. And they know, that, they know that those will likely be changing, um, but, they're getting, but they're able then to respond in terms of decision making. Now, the next thing I want to talk, so th that's the climate science part and the climate risk information part. This part is what is the new part that has been added in um, to, uh, under Mayor de Blasio because he is very, very interested and concerned with the communities and the neighborhoods of New York City and throughout all his programs. And Robin Lachenko is the lead, the co-lead uh, with Sheila Foster on the work bringing the community groups into this process and so that the voices of the neighborhoods and uh, the communities can be heard in the development of the responses. Great. So I mentioned the New York City Panel on Climate Change, and these are the reports of the actual assessments that include the projections. But beyond the projections, the latest thinking on, for example, vulnerability, latest thinking on adaptation and resilience, latest thinking on interdependencies. And um, this, as I said, here's Local Law 42. And these are actually then the documents of record that decision makers can then use. Um, I put this in, but if we're actually showing this on the web, we have to put a big draft over this part right here. Um, because this is absolutely work in progress that uh, Bob Kopp and others, Michael Oppenheimer, uh, Vivian Gornitz, are working on. And it's a good example of new understanding of risks, evolving risks, and the need to update, to coming to the decision to update the projections. So this, these are New York City sea level rise projections relative to 2004. They're in inches because of working with the stakeholders. Um, and this set were the, uh, were the sea level rise projections in the, the 2015 NPCC report. We're now in the next round, we call it MPCC3, and, and there has been a lot of melting, observations of rapid melting, in particular in the Antarctic. So our sea level rise group in NPCC has get together and made a draft set 
of what we're calling the ARIM, Antarctic Rapid Ice Melt Scenario, that we're adding on here for the 2080s and 2100. But we do all of this very carefully with a lot of discussion, a lot of peer review, a lot of discussion with the city. Because they can't, we can't just be surprising them with, oh, no, it's all changed, and now you should be using this. They get whiplash. And I'm looking at Nilda because I know you understand this. So I uh, just wanted to share. This is very much in draft, has not gone through the whole vetting process yet. But this is an example of how the scientists and the risk information is updated. And with these, we then are able to, with those underlying projections, we are then able, and this is, this is work uh, from Bill Selecki's uh, group at Hunter, we're then able to, for example, make future coastal flood risk maps. Um, this is for the sea level rise alone, which is very likely, we all know this, to increase uh, the coastal flooding in frequency, extent, and height due only to the sea level rise. In terms of the storms, and maybe some of the other speakers are going to speak to what's going on with the storms, uh, we provide as much information as we can about the storms, but we're also very clear about what are the uncertainties. When we can make us a robust projection, we include it. When we, we, we include quantitative. Otherwise, we, we use qualitative statements, and also, again, with all the references that we're basing those qualitative statements on. That's how we work. So those are showing those flood risk maps. And we're now in discussion with FEMA, as well as New York City, to improve the uh, FEMA firm mapping process to include sea level rise. I just put this in for Hurricane Sandy because, of course, it's the extreme events. While mean changes are very, very important and have their own impacts, it's the extreme events which, of course, are the most destructive. And I, I, I didn't change this slide, but I, I would say a tipping point. I want to ask the audience here, all, all of us together, it was certainly a tipping point for New York City in terms of responding to climate change. Was it in New Jersey as well? I've, given, I've assigned to some students the topic, Hurricane Sandy, a tale of two states and one city. And I think that this is something that we can really all learn from each other. What are the lessons learned from how New Jersey responded? How did New York respond? How did New York State respond? Because there were some issues between New York City and New York State in terms of the buyouts, for example, um, that uh, our New York State governor, Governor Cuomo, uh, initiated a buyout program in Staten Island. And, in, um, and for the New York City, there is, was uh, the leader, the leadership at that time was very like, we we're, going to, we're going to stay by the coast and you know, not retreat. So um, these are some issues that I think we should all discuss together. But the one reason why it was a tipping point also is because it really got New York City to think about their resilience approaches and strategies. And uh, I think one reason why I think New York is doing a good job is because it's really taking a portfolio, what, what we call the portfolio approach. You have to address policies in terms of, of course, your, your uh, disaster risk and reduction, uh, design guidelines, insurance, all the policy aspects. You, a lot of people just choose engineering. What are we going to do on the engineering side? People, I think, love to glom onto one solution and say, this is going to save us. But really, that is, that's one part in a portfolio of approaches. Um, a, a lot of people love the ecosystem approaches. Very important in terms of, I put in the oyster beds and things like that, the west, wetland restoration, very important. But at the same time, the social planning and the social networking, the social programs are critically important as well. And, it, and I do think New York really took on this portfolio approach in response to Hurricane Sandy. I won't go into details on this. This is a very recent um, uh, work of New York City in which they have now, they're, they're still in testing mode. They're doing some pilot pro projects using the, new, the NPCC projections to actually create design guidelines. And these guidelines are to be used in the design of all New York City capital projects. In order to scale up, remember what I was saying in the beginning, how are we going to make this happen across the entire region? 
Those scale issues, scaling up issues are enormous. We need this kind of policy guidance, design guidance, that every architect, every planner can go to to say, this is how I deal with climate change. Otherwise, they're going, what do I do? Do I have to learn about all this stuff completely? And you know, it's so complicated. That's why we all need to work together. Uh, some examples of the resilience projects in New York City, of course, you know there's the, uh, there's the Big U, which was part of Rebuild by Design. And I know in the Meadowlands, there's a, a Rebuild by Design project as well. So these are some of the uh, renderings of what resilience projects will look like. This is the last slide on this section about our own region. And it's about cross, more specifically, about cross-jurisdictional cooperation. So one of the things is the vertical, uh, the, the vertical cross-jurisdiction issues, which every city in the world has. City, state or province, nation, multi-country, multi multiple country regions, international. Every city has to be negotiating its way through the jurisdictional issues. Um, but we can start to see at the federal level some work going on across federal agencies after, for example, to create recovery map tools. Um, uh, I mentioned about the FEMA map projects, how to finance resilience projects. Again, one city cannot alone finance what is actually needed. So this is why we have to have a lot of cooperation to actually, again, take this to scale. But I just highlighted at the end the New York and New Jersey cooperation and to see how we can help do that. Now, I want to quickly now, we're going to go back up internationally from our own region. What is the context of, of our own metropolitan region in, re in regard to the other cities around the world? So in this regard, UCERN, it stands for the Urban Climate Change Research Network. We invite everyone to join, go to the website, and send in your CV. Um, but we don't reject anybody, so please, please do join. Over 800 scientists working with many cities around the world, and it was formed 10 years ago at the time when C40 held a summit in New York. Um, what we do is to provide, the mission is to provide the knowledge foundation so that every city, every metropolitan region can have the information needed to be able to respond. So what we do together is, we're not just a listserv, we actually work together and we create assessment reports and that's what these are. And this one is coming out. We hope, I'm looking at Bill, also a principal in this effort um, in January. It's at Cambridge University Press right now, and we're expecting the final proofs. It's over 800 pages. Because think of that, that's the information that's truly needed across all the urban sectors, across the ecosystems, across addressing mitigation and adaptation. I'm, but you don't, right now, later on, you, when it comes out, you have to read all 800 pages. Right now, I'm going to give you the key findings in a, in a few moments. I'm going to give you the key findings. But you still have to buy it and read it. Uh, this is what's inside it. These are the chapters you see from, all the, from climate, urban climate science, equity and environmental justice. We were discussing that before the program. Solid waste. And then, of course, government is, governance issues. That's all these 16 chapters. We have a summary for city leaders that was um, um, released at the uh, at COP21 in Paris for the mayor's summit there at Paris City Hall. And then we have case studies. I'm going to show you a little bit about the case studies as well, the case study docking station. We also have regional hubs because this uh, this information has to be, it can't just be globalized. It has to be regionalized. So we have wonderful hub directors. You can't see the map, but imagine a global map behind all this. <laughs> and here they are in, in Rio de Janeiro, Durban, South Africa, Shanghai. Um, we're talking to Dakan, Bangkok. Paris was the lead one. We have a Nordic node for high mountain cities. And I'm looking at Jim Miller because he works in high, high mountain and high altitude places. And the most recent one was just launched um, uh, in Australia. And so this, so again, this kind of 
fractal approach to networking, I think, is absolutely critical. Here's the online searchable open source database. Uh, with oh, It's actually over 100 uh, reviewed case studies. Uh, here they are. These are what the different colors show the different the populations of the different case study cities, uh, the case studies of the cities. These were done by people in the cities themselves, because cities relate to what's going on. What are you doing in your city? What are you doing in city? Not just us telling them this is uh, telling this is what you should do, or this is what someone else is doing. They really that's why the networks are so successful because that's their peer group. But the point I want to make here is based on these different populations that we have to, this is I think, from coming from New York, we have to really be thinking about this all the time. Small, medium, and as well as the large, as well as the mega cities are important. And so we have colleagues in the Nordic node, and what they call the small and medium-sized cities is they call them the unusual suspects. And I think we all have to think about that and, and really work hard to be sure we're not leaving small and medium-sized cities behind. Now, here come the results of the major findings, the major messages from the assessment, second assessment report on climate change in cities. And we call them the five pathways to transformation. And I'm going to end with going through these. The first one is, in cities, that we need to integrate mitigation and adaptation. We cannot just only think about mitigation on one side and think about adaptation on the other. For example, if we are, if we are going to use to create new public transportation systems, right, which will help on reducing uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions from cars, let's say, we cannot site them in floodplains of either the coasts or the rivers. We have to be thinking, having two thoughts in our brains, and, but city people are very smart, and we can do this. But this is absolutely important that we do not bifurcate mitigation and adaptation. So that's the first pathway to transformation. The second one is another coordination across time scales. The disaster risks, disasters happen in real time now. Climate change is, some things are happening now, but are, is projected to be very long term. We have to be able to prepare and coordinate across our responses to climate disasters right now, as well as develop the long term plans for climate change. That's the second pathway. The third is um, on how do we generate the risk information. So I was sharing with you the risk information that was co-generated in New York City with um, the city of New York. And this is absolutely essential. Because if we just sit by our computers, you all know this by now, and create the, 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 and throw our projections over the fence, they are not going to be used. In order for them to be used, we must work with the decision makers who are going to be using them. Now, I'm not saying this lightly, because there's probably one of the biggest mantras of all of the work that we do is work with stakeholders, work with stakeholders. It's what I, what I know you all who have done this, and stakeholders in the room, I know for you working with scientists the other way back, it's challenging. It is hard. People are coming from very different places. So don't think it's all like, you know, getting together and, you know, saying, oh, isn't this wonderful? It's not. It really is batting out these differences in viewpoints, in reward systems, in decision needs, in, in time frames. Scientists, science takes time. Deci city decisions need to be made quickly. So these are some of their very real challenges. But we must step up to these if we're going to be successful in the scaling up that is actually needed. The fourth one is one, it, this came out in chapter after chapter in ARC 3, focus on disadvantaged populations. Unless the work that we and the cities do together focuses on the poorest, the most vulnerable people, and every city has these people. We will not truly be fulfilling 
the responsibility and the goal towards sustainable response and equitable response to the climate change challenges. The last one, the last pathway is a bit of a, of a it's a kind of three pathways in one, three pathlets in one. One is that we have to work on governance in the cities. We had a great chapter led by Patty, Patty Romero Lancal and with a great team of governance specialists. We have to work with the governance people, the governments, so that there are the kind of structures that are in place, in part, you know, with some lessons, some from New York, but, but from other places, what's working, transparency, uh, you know, uh, c continuation of pr programmatic continuation. I mean, there's just a lot of challenges on governance. But this is clearly important that we have to have good governance structures in place. Um, and then the second part, of course, so that's one thing that we need to make sure. That's the one pathlet within p pathway five. The next one is about finance. This costs money. And most cities, no, I think no city in the world will have enough money to actually undertake uh, some of, uh, you, know, all, you know, all of it. You know, while there's, some of these things are expensive to redo drainage or put on mitigation projects to actually refit everything. How are the finance, how, how can these be financed? And this has to be worked on, both from how can cities finance part of it, how can states and national governments, we have to make alliances there, as well as for the developing country cities, of course, the Green Climate Fund and GEF programs, et cetera. But finance is a very, very key. So we have a whole um, chapter in R3 um, it's called the finance, Economics, Finance, and Private Sector. And of course, private sector will, is keenly involved. And I was just actually at a think tank breakfast with private sector developers who in, wanted to hear, well, what's really going on with climate change and how can, how can basically, how can we pick up the slack that governments can't? And the final one I mentioned before, the knowledge networks. So there's just so, we, I, the cities that are gonna be successful are part of these networks. There's the, I've mentioned, we've mentioned the C40s, uh, city uh, summit group, cities group, but also ICLE has done tremendous work over the decades uh, to bring many, many cities um, uh, on board, um, as well as UCLG and other networks. And so we definitely, um, the authors of ARC3, uh, in terms of encouraging cities, are very encouraging of cities to join and participate in knowledge networks. So here are the five pathways. I won't repeat them, but that's the idea. And then if, you've, if cities can really, as we said, you have to not just think two things at once, five things at once with three in one of them. This, this is what cities we actually have found from working together with all the researchers that this is what cities need to do to take on these very big challenges. So this is the last slide because we want to share with you about a conference that you may have heard about. And, um, and this is a, a conference that is being organized by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, and for the first time, the IPCC is, is also recognizing that cities have an important role to play. And so uh, they are, um, have, uh, have made, they are making plans to have a special report on cities. That's not gonna be in this cycle, that will be in the AR7, but to get ready for that special report, they're holding a conference in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, in March of next year. And just to prove to you, Bill and I are on the scientific steering committee of that, just to prove to you that we are not alone in this room of the people who are excited about working about this and working on this together. Uh, the, the conference plan to have 30 sessions, uh, about 30, 30 sessions and 150 
talks. Guess how many proposals we received? Over 1,000. So this impetus to work with cities, work on cities, do cities reports, enable cities is, is really gathering, gathering strength. So hope to see you all there um, at, um, at, the, at the IPCC Cities and Climate Change Conference. Um, two, I have two final points. Uh, one is that the IPCC is doing this. It shows that the city, that the countries are beginning to get it because the I stands for, the I in IPCC stands for intergovernmental. IPCC is run by the United Nations, the WM, World Meteorological Organization, and the United Nations Environment Program. That is made up of the countries, that they are now recognizing that cities have to be a part of the mix formally, right? A special report, a whole conference on cities. This is evidence that the countries are, in fact, beginning to recognize that next time they write an agreement, they better put cities in a, with a capital letter. My final point is back to us here in the New York metropolitan region. Let's work together and cooperate so that our metropolitan region can continue to be the lead in responding to climate change. So in all the first responders, our region, our metropolitan region, and the work that we do together will really be the first of the first responders. Thank you very much. Should I stay here? <laughs> oh, OK. OK, good. But, and I, I, with the questions, though, I probably turn to so, Bill and others. Yeah, so we're going to have um, a few minutes. We have a few minutes for questions now. And our custom with whenever we do these symposia and other climate events as well is that we always invite students to ask questions first. Everyone's welcome to ask questions, but we really try to encourage questions from students. Great. So uh, please, um, there is a microphone that folks should head up to in the middle of the room just so everyone can hear the question. So if folks don't mind lining up and start, we'll start the Q&A. Hi. And please say who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Virginia Lamb, and I'm a, it's a little complicated. I'm, a gra I'm in grad school for soil science at UMass Amherst. I, that's my, where I got my PhD. Oh, <laughs> awesome, that's very exciting. So my, I have two questions, one sort of a simple and one a little uh, bigger. Uh, the one question is in your, in your ARC, ARC3, were agriculture and soil science listed in the 16 points for uh, mitigation potential? OK, let's change? do both, and then I'll answer. OK, the second question is, in light of the um, tone being set by the federal government, do you feel like that the progress by cities uh, is regardless of that uh, philosophy? Great. OK, thanks for those questions. OK, ag and soil science. Yes, my home field right here from right, right, from <laughs> right, from right over there at Cook. Um, we, in the urban ecology chapter of ARC3, there is a, a section on urban agriculture. We, very, we tried to get, Bill, you remember, we tried to get an urban, an, an urban ag chapter going. We, we couldn't, even though there's a lot of buzz about it, we couldn't find the actual like, critical mass to do a whole chapter on it. But we certainly want to and hope to. Also, on, just on the soil science part, that's a great suggestion. We need to include the soil science aspects, the urban soils. And there is a lot of work just on urban soils. But then, it's, then again, for the interactions with climate change, that's what the, the assessment is really all about. So that's it. On the federal government side, um, I am, uh, I am a, a federal government scientist. So I, um, I really don't comment on any of the politics of, of, the, of our situation that we find ourselves in as uh, Americans. But what I will say is that I believe that 
the role of the cities is even more important now, and that it is absolutely incumbent upon all of us as researchers to continue our work on climate change and cities and climate, climate change in cities, the topic here, and climate change in general. It's absolutely essential for us to be sure we're doing that. And a final thought on that, a final word is in these very challenging times, I believe it's actually, I, and I feel this, I feel, and we were discussing this earlier, it's actually energizing because we must do it. It's not like, oh, this would be great, yeah, it's very, you know, yeah, it's good. It's, no, it's not like that. I believe it's that we now must do the research. Yes. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I am a climate educator from Delaware State University, uh, Dover, Delaware. Uh, my question is on what is the business climate like? Are they very supportive? Are there a lot of resistance? And in terms of uh, implementing some of the sustainable solutions, like we generally don't deal a lot, but I know there are a number of programs that are dealing directly with business innovations and such. What is your take on this? Wait, could you repeat what was your main question? Uh, which group were you saying? What's uh, their business? response? Business, uh, business. Yeah, businesses, yeah. Yeah, okay, great question. All right, this is absolutely critical. Just as, you know, just as I think that there's been a big push to, you know, for the city governments, like the governments and sec stakeholders uh, to work with the researchers, I actually think we should start a whole push to the private sector. I really think we should. So of course, some, some, many, and you probably know this, there are many, many businesses have recognized the risks and have stepped up and they've made their own business networks and like for the, the series group um, because they recognize the actual risks to their businesses. Um, but again, in order for the business sector, just as in order to, for the governments, I think we have to strengthen the interactions between the researchers and the, corp the, the corporate and, and private sectors, sector. But I also think we have to be realistic about how challenging, I think in some ways that's even more challenging than, than working with the public side. But I think, um, you know, for example, we've worked uh, like companies like Siemens uh, has, is one of our supporters and funders for ARC3. So, uh, and many of them are seeing the business opportunities for implementing all those adaptation resiliency projects. So there's huge, so all the big, big engineering firms are on this, but I also believe they are still looking to us to provide the science foundation for the work that then they are doing uh, the implementation work that they're doing. But I think that we need to, let's have a big outreach. That's a good thing to come out of this, a big outreach to the private sector as well. Other, other questions? Hi, I'm Stephen Marcus. I uh, graduated from medical school 52 years ago, but still think I'm a student. So maybe I can ask a question. Wow, you're, fantastic. You're, 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 I've, I'm a medical toxicologist. <clears throat> Your discussion is all on mitigation and resiliency. Is it uh, uh, non-politically correct to talk about the city's roles in prevention? Very challenging question. Uh, nothing is non-politically correct. I think every question is absolutely um, a good question. Prevention. Uh, could you elaborate, please? I'm asking a question back. Could you? What is your thinking behind this question? Well, uh, as I drove here, and I'm a former Rutgers employee, uh, I saw this parking lot out here with solar panels, and that's one minor little component of. Uh, trying to do something about use of fossil fuels and what have you. But I've got an electric car. There was no place for me to plug my electric mm -hmm. car mm -hmm. into. I was recently in Slovenia, a tiny little country, I don't even know where the hell I was, but walking down the street, 
there was actually a recharge station right on one of the city streets for free. There were two Teslas plugged into it. I can't afford a Tesla. I've got a little Ford. <coughs> but that little country was that, and that city, Lubchenco or however it's pronounced, which is the capital city of Slovenia, was making a small effort to do something. Uh, big cities are huge, uh, uh, I forget the actual term, I'm sorry, a senior moment, uh, uh, islands of, 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 of heat. Uh, and adds tremendously to, to the problems of climate change. So there are ways that, that uh, cities, I would think, if they really put their heads together and worked on it, might have some role in prevention of continuation of, of climate change. That's why I asked that. Yes, all okay. Of, all of your discussions are all mitigation, not prevention. Uh, it's fantastic, and it's a medical model, I believe, that you're... Yes, which is, I think, absolutely fantastic. And I think we should think about this. I, I think we should think more about just instead of this kind of response, you know, here is the challenge, respond, respond, respond. Okay, what can we actually do way from, you know, from the beginning so that it, things don't even happen? Right. Um, let me just say something. I, this is about the, it's a cultural thing. And I want, of course, our, our esteemed social science colleagues uh, you know, I'm just, I'm really a, a physical and biophysical, biophysical and physical scientist. But there's something about our, about the American culture, I think, that is really, because we are so focused on individualism and home rule, that is actually, this is in response to you saying you found the electric car plug-ins, right, the, 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 the plug-in places in, in a small country somewhere else because it's actually really quite challenging for us to come together for cooperative solutions, I think, so that we can think about the prevention ahead of time. And so I think, we'd, I think again, it shows that we have to work from the social science side as well as the biological and physical as well. You see, it's, yeah, it's not just engineering. It's what are those barriers? And I think there's a lot of work now on actually, right, Robin, about like, why is it that people aren't adopting this? Like, why, are, why aren't people changing? Barriers, yeah. Cultural barriers. Right. Sort of a, absolutely. It's definitely a collaborative project. It, yes, <laughs> to, to really get to the prevention side. But it's, a, it's really, a, I think, a great model for us to think about that, that medical, uh, the medical model. We definitely have time for at least one more question. I'm just, I'm good. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Judith Weiss. I'm a professor emeritus here at Rutgers Newark. Um, I'm a marine biologist, and I know one of the New Jersey, New York, working together types of proposals that there is a group pushing is a um, tidal gate that would go from Sandy Hook up to Rockaway mm -hmm. or somewhere like that for the next when the next hurricane you know if the thing ever gets built um, the thing about that is that during normal times when there isn't the hurricane coming in this still would block a huge amount of the water flow into the New York New Jersey Harbor and would have you know, devastating effects on the marine environment in our estuary, even when there isn't a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And there is a group really pushing this proposal and raising money and all that sort of thing. And I'm rather alarmed about it. And I wonder what you think of it and what you think are the prospects for it really ever happening. Right. So. The issue of the tidal barriers was the single most contentious issue, and I think Bill will, right, you were there for some of it too, Robin. Single most contentious issue in the New York City panel on climate change in uh, both one and two. Because there is a group of people, some of them are engineers, I think some of them are others, but some, I would say many of them are engineers, this is, remember when I showed that portfolio approach and I said people glom on to one thing that's going to actually, oh, let's do this one thing and then it's all going to be solved. 
And I would put the barriers, it, the title barriers in that uh, category. Um, on the one hand, there, that it, there is, for the, for the area that would be protected by those barriers, it basically solves the problem However, of the sea level rise. However, as you so rightly said, there are many other issues associated it, with it, and it would take a huge amount of time to, and very important to do the studies on the ecology, the ecology of it, the ecological effects of it, and the social effects. Because what, would, what those do is they, they protect some people, but not others. What do you say to the communities who are next door who says, it's like, oh, we're not in it. Right? Final, final thought of this is, I, what we recommended, what we came to after hours and hours and hours of very heated discussion was in the, um, we said, of course, what do, what do researchers, but I, not, you know, I don't like to say this, but what, we said, if, if, you know, as this continues, it would have to be studied basically the hell out of it <laughs> to really, really make sure what it would be doing. But, and now here's a, my final comment on it, which is, it is the most expensive option as well. So those barriers are the most expensive. So in or which is another reason why they would have to be studied so much, but also as we instead what New York City came to, developed by Robin and Gary Yo, the flexible adaptation pathways, that paper is it, be, it went on to become the foundation for the US National Academies of Science in terms of fl a flexible approach to understanding the risks, taking uh, actions that are appropriate for our understanding now and in the future, but also given the budgets that are available and knowing that things may get worse, need to be tracked, indicators and monitoring before jumping in at the very beginning to, to going to the most expensive option. Can, do, can we have one more? Just do one more? All right, and I'll make a very quick answer. <laughs> but that was a long answer, <laughs> the barriers. Uh, this is a follow-up to Dr. Marcus's question on, uh, on, the, on the medical model, and yeah. also one I noticed, because uh, I wrote down, your first pathway had said something about prevention as well as mitigation. Mm -hmm. I think it's appropriate on the topic of cities to mention that there are people, non-scientists, not I'm a scientist, but not scientists necessarily, there are people who are working on something called the political will for a livable world. And notice that the, the source of most of the contamination is carbon. People manufacture and profit from carbon. Uh, the group is called Citizens Climate Lobby. It is funded by only citizens. Their solution is nonpartisan to create the political will, which is to do something like a carbon fee and a dividend for the people. Uh, you can find it on their website, mm -hmm. and I think it is an important topic because I know it's not the only organization, and we have chapters all over New Jersey, including Edison, and in, in New York City. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. I really My pleasure. Have, no, definitely. I, I, think, I think we should leave it there because yes, it's, we, we've been focusing primarily on the role of researchers and science here, but clearly for this to happen at, at scale, the, 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 the political will of the citizens is absolutely essential. Thanks. Well, thank you for a great session. Cynthia, and thank you for the good questions. So we'll now do a short break, and then we'll return for our plenary panel. Thank you. We're going to get started again, please. So this is the second half of our symposium today. This is our plenary panel on cities and climate change. 
Unfortunately, one of our speakers had to cancel. Mustafa Ali wasn't able to make it due to a family emergency. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and introduce our three panelists. Just briefly, there's a more full um, CV or sort of bio in the program itself. So um, our first panelist is going to be Nilda Mesa. Nilda is the Director of Urban Sustainability and Equity Planning at Columbia's University, Columbia University's Earth Institute Urban Design Lab. Previously, Nilda was the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability, where, among other things, she was one of the leaders on the very pathbreaking and transformational One NYC plan, which um, is their long-term sustainability plan. So Nilda will be first, and our second speaker will be Julie Pullen. Julie is an associate professor in civil environmental and ocean engineering at Stevens. She studies complex coastal, ocean, air, and sea interactions, those surrounding cities and mountains, and utilizing high resolution ocean atmosphere, ocean atmosphere hydrology models and observations from around the globe. I think that's the first time I've ever said that. <laughs> Julie is also a board member of the Waterfront Alliance. And it, that is an organization representing over 900 groups with a stake in New York and New Jersey's waterfront. And then our third speaker is, um, who will be rounding on our panel, is Bill Selecki. Bill is one of our, another one of our alum. He, Bill got his PhD in geography at Rutgers before I was there. And um, <laughs> he's now a professor of geography at Hunter College. And Bill is currently serving as the coordinating lead author for the first chapter of the IPCC's 1.5 report. So he may have a few words to say about that report. Um, he's also been lead author on the US National Climate Assessment, the, the third assessment. He's currently a lead author on the Northeast chapter of the fourth assessment. He's, as you already heard, co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, with, along with Cynthia, and also currently co-PI on the climate change, climate change risk in the urban Northeast, the NOAA RESA project. So thank you for all our panelists, and I will turn it over to our first speaker, Nilda. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Marjorie. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is talk a bit about um, the, you know, urban climate change sort of issues that come up. Uh, and I'm going to focus in particular on one um, uh, issue that came up in New York City to get as an example of how uh, we approached uh, some of these um, clients, sort of some of these issues on coming up with policy to address um, impacts of or potential impacts of uh, climate change. Um, okay, so what, I'd, what I'm going to be doing today is focusing a bit on, you know, from inside city government, but, you know, also a bit outside, um, what are some of the key factors in integrating some of the knowledge and um, the data that comes towards um, city policy making officials. And, you know, a lot of this is true not just for cities, but it's also true for states um, and at the federal level. But I'm going to talk, I'm going to really focus more on uh, cities here. Um, so some of the key factors, so one of the things that, and I've gone back and forth between Columbia and the city, and I was at the federal government and the Clinton administration for a while. Um, so I've gone back and forth between sort of government and academia for a bit. And um, some of the thing, and I, and I feel like I kind of have like a foot in both uh, planets, <laughs> both planets. And, you know, so some of the things that, um, that, I, that I've seen over the years is that there is a bit of a disconnect between what happens at the research level and also what happens at the policy making or sausage making level, <laughs> um, depending on where you sit in um, various parts of government. Um, and so I'm gonna try to demystify some of that, I think, today, um, and then also point out some things that are not necessarily obvious if you're not working uh, in the middle of government and trying to resolve many, many um, competing interests um, at the time. Um, before that, though, I just wanted to mention uh, there are uh, some questions that came up in the last session um, in, you know, in response to some of Cynthia's excellent um, observations. And so somebody asked a question about um, how responsive is the private sector 
And I would say to that, uh, it depends. You know, it sort of depends on whether uh, they think that there is profit to be made from it. So you will find renewable energy companies, you know, really out there because they can see that there's profit to be made, you know, whether it's solar or wind or, you know, whatever. And, and I would suspect that that's only going to um, increase over the years in, in that sector. Um, but then you have other um, actors, for example, some building owners who, um, if they can uh, take sustainability and turn it as like a marketing advantage for their buildings, that's how they're interested in it. But if it's sort of like a smaller scale building owner or their market isn't necessarily like the upscale, you know, commercial office buildings, then for them it's a real impediment to justify the extra expense. And they don't necessarily have the resources at hand um, in order to be able to make the business case for it. So it's really important to understand that quite often with the private sector, you have to look at the business case. Um, they will be much more responsive to that. And in many cases, there is a very solid uh, business case that can be made for um, you know, the um, initiatives and the kinds of approaches that people can take in this. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a classic, it depends. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out was um, the United States has um, a, an unusual system in that uh, under the Constitution, states are granted specific rights and specific authority. And from that authority, so, so the states from their authorities grant cities their own authorities. So, um, it differs wildly amongst states and cities what kind of jurisdiction they have in order to do things. These are, and these are important and very relevant. So if you're going to look at something like um, in New York City, you know, you have to look at, and I just use that as an example, but this is true of any other city. You have to look at, you know, what's the state jurisdiction, what's the federal jurisdiction, and then what is the city granted from that. But the state having, the states having their own um, you know, rights that are granted to them under the Constitution is very powerful. Um, it is unlike many other countries where states and provinces have the powers that are delegated to them by the federal, their federal government, rather than as a separate authority from the Constitution. That, I think, is a real strength for the U.S. So while people overseas may look at um, you know, the U.S. is crazy and it's chaotic and of course we all know it kind of is. Um, that's also a real opportunity in these times when we can't necessarily rely on the federal government and we don't quite know <laughs> sort of what's coming next, um, you know, in that. So more than ever, it's important um, that cities and states, you know, act and they in fact have much more ability to do so. Um, than in other countries. I was, I came back from a, a trip to Germany. Um, I was a, on the, the U.S. Embassy in Berlin uh, brought me over as part of their speakers program. And the reason that they brought me over was that so I could speak exactly about this topic on cities and states in the United States. And so, you know, five days, five different cities, like where am I? But um, one of the things that the Germans who I was meeting with were surprised by was just this sort of delegation of power from the Constitution directly to the states and what that means for cities because they don't have anything like that. Their building codes are set by the EU. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a profoundly different um, dynamic in some other parts of the world. So I say this partly as like, you know, go cities and like let's, you know, take advantage, go states, you know, and let's take advantage of this because uh, I think it is a real strength. So, all right, some of the key factors in um, cities coming up with policies to address uh, climate and sustainability in general are um, sort of, you know, what, in fact, what are their, what are their jurisdictions? What are the levers that they have? So, um, for example, with New York, um, if you're looking at public transportation, you know, it's very complicated because there's the MTA, there's also the Port Authority, and the city doesn't necessarily have control over its own subway system. They can, you know, sort of, uh, you know, include things like the ferry system, 
which doesn't have to do with the states, but it's very important for cities to look at and to figure out like where is it that we, we can actually do things and where are the kind of um, you know avenues where the kind of cracks, <laughs> if you will, through which you know the light may come through. Um, and it's it's important to developing the strategy. And then you know you also have to look at you know what's available federal funding and you know policy and so forth. You also have to look at you know economic health and stability of a city. Um, so sustainability and you know climate issues for a city are not necessary. It's one of those things like in the short term, people are like, yeah, yeah, okay, we can deal with that like in a few years. You know, the immediate stuff that people really care about are things like affordable housing. Um, depending on the city, it could be air pollution, um, economic development. You know, those kinds of you know ease of public transportation. You know, those kinds of things. And those are the short-term issues that the constituents will care about, and they will be complaining about to their um, city council members, to the mayors, and so forth. So there, so people need to be aware that there is this kind of balancing act. It's all connected by and large. But you know, to the degree that you can work on the connections and you can look at what are the you know sort of immediate things and the you know the short and medium term concerns that the residents of cities have and tie them in with climate, it's a real um, it's a real advantage. Um, and you have to look at you know sort of what are the strengths of you know what are the what's the economic health of the city? Is it growing? Is the population declining? You know what is the economic base? Um, so, you know, when we were doing 1NYC, so I was the, the head of 1NYC, and so when we were doing that, um, one of the things that we looked at was sort of, you know, what are the demographic changes, what are the trends, and we looked at it at this kind of, um, you know, granular level to some degree. So we looked at it in terms of, you know, of the five boroughs, which ones, are, you know, which are the, you know, where are the places where economic um, growth is healthiest, you know, where the, where's the job rate increasing, also where's the population increasing, and then we layered that over, you know, the existing transportation systems to figure out, you know, what's the, um, you know, what's the access to public transportation to good paying jobs that people have in various neighborhoods. So that was one of the key, and it was a difficult measure to come up with, but that was one of the key things where we were trying to link up how these all sort of um, you know, fit together and how can we improve economic health as well as promote you know, sustainability, air quality you know, concerns and so forth. Um, another thing is transparency and engagement. Um, this is a very tricky thing. So um, one of the, you know, there are different, di different cities have different models for doing this. So New York has a community board system, which is very robust. There are, I think, around 100 of them or so. Um, the, but that you can't just look at what exists, what's the formal thing that exists. You also have to look at more informal networks and informal ways of, and, and maybe non-traditional ways of reaching people. So when we were developing 1NYC, we, did, um, we, did, we didn't have that much time to do, we had about four and a half months or whatever to do it before the statutory deadline. So um, you know, the, the um, outreach, the engagement um, was, you know, reflected the amount of time that we had. Um, but we did polling, we did um, a massive set of email blasts to people in the city asking them like, okay, we're doing this long-term sustainability plan. What is the one thing that you want us to focus on? And, you know, looking at economic health as well as, um, you know, the, the standard sort of three pillars. Um, so, it, and by using, and then we also had meetings. And so by doing that, we could get sort of a more robust um, sense of what it is that, you know, that were people's priorities. And it actually confirmed what we thought, which was, you know, it's a lot about housing affordability um, and, you know, other, other things along the, you know, housing and affordability um, along those lines. Um, you have to have um, this kind of uh, integration within various planning processes. So we had, at the same time that we were doing 1NYC, we also had uh, the budget process and the 10-year capital planning process going on. So um, it was the first time that the city um, organized, sort of organized these um, processes, you know, sort of all together. And it was really vitally important because it's, you can't have a credible plan, you can't have credible planning unless you have some budget that's attached to these various initiatives. And so, um, the, and that had not been the case 
in um, previous plans, um, and it's also not necessarily the case, um, you know, for for you know, example, other cities. So um, we knew that we were going to be hammered on um, how real these things were, and so we were very conscious and very deliberate about trying to line all of these up, which was not easy. <laughs> but um, the payoff is that now those processes are actually pretty well aligned. So it was hard to do it the first time, but then once we had the setup in place, that's actually how the city will um, go about, you know, fulfilling its um, initiatives and goals and visions and so forth with uh, one NYC. You also need to have um, city council involved. Um, so a lot of what we, de what we did was uh, dependent on um, city council legislation. And so um, you need to have, and very fortunately for us, we had, um, I had a very good relationship working with council members. We had um, one of them, the head of the Environment Committee, was on our Sustainability Advisory Board, so they were like really well integrated into the process. Um, and so you need to have that dialogue, you need to have that sort of sense of working together on stuff, because they can be incredibly helpful as well as um, not helpful if you know, you're not all um, together on things. And you also have to have a certain amount of private sector commitment. So that was one thing in our, you know, it, not just in 1NYC, but the, but the processes and the reports and the planning that came after that, uh, we also looked at how do we bring in um, the private sector because you know, one of the things that we did not want to do was to come up with uh, initiatives that were A, really expensive and B, ineffective. You know, so we didn't want to just sort of pronounce things and say, okay, now you building owners or you know, whoever it is, um, you have to do these and then find out that in fact it was never going to work because you know, of whatever structural reasons you know, that they have. So um, we really leaned on them and the city you know, I think tries to continue to lean on um, some of the key players in the private sector. And last but certainly not least is that you have to have adequate data. And so it's a, a bit of an art to, f to ask the right questions to begin with on you know, what is the data that you actually need to underlie stuff. But you need the data to come up with the policies, but then you also need it to figure out if these policies and these initiatives are in fact working. You know, and if they are, uh, in fact, helping to re, you know achieve these objectives and, and resolve some of the um, issues that have come up, uh, I think sometimes um, in these processes, what happens is that you don't necessarily have the follow up. Um, and then you don't necessarily have a sense of whether things are working, but it's vitally important because if it's not working, what's the point, right? And so you need to be able to modify policies later on. You need to be able to learn um, from um, what you've been putting out um, in these, you know, in these uh, initiatives. Um, okay, so here's an example. When I talk about levers and what is it that the city can do and can't do, so here's an example. I mean, these are just like questions that come up and these are true for pretty much any city that does this. So it's, they're as true for Los Angeles and Chicago and Hartford and, you know, you name it. Um, Miami, you know, you name it. Um, so certain questions that you have to look at first is who owns the electric utility and who owns the, you know, the water system and, and the water utility? These are two huge factors in reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, for cities. And so if a city itself, so for example, Los Angeles uh, has its own Department of Water and Power, so they own that. So they can come out with different initiatives and different um, you know, policy directives and do them. New York City does not, and neither do many other places. So it's one thing for New York to say, you know, we're going to be you know, taking on these huge challenges that, you know, and setting these very aggressive goals, but it's another thing to actually figure out how you're going to meet them. So, New York City has um, something, like, and I'm going to I'll cover this, you know, a bit also later. But um, New York City does an annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory. About 70% or so of greenhouse gas emissions in New York City come from buildings and the energy supply that goes into the buildings. About 20% um, you know, or so is from transportation. Another 7% is solid waste. 
So the profile for New York City is different from what it is for other cities. So Los Angeles, for example, much more heavily geared uh, towards transportation. And the, the US average is uh, you know, much more evenly divided between energy and buildings and transportation. Um, you know, per person, New York has uh, something like uh, one third less, at least one third less of greenhouse gas emissions compared to other cities. And so, you know, you have to start with, you know, where you are. So for New York, we are very focused on buildings and energy. Less than 5% of um, electricity that comes into the city comes from renewable sources. So, and about 40% of New York City's greenhouse gas, or I should say about 40% of New York State's greenhouse gas emissions are generated in New York City. There is a divide, there's a split between the renewables that are generated upstate in New York State and what's consumed downstate. So the renewables that are generated upstate don't make it to downstate, and that's where the real load is. So questions that come up for, you know, and this is, and I, again, I use New York as an example, but these are the kinds of questions that you need to be asking if you're looking at cities and what, what can you actually do. Similar set of, similar set of um, considerations for the water system. New York does own its own water system, so it can do much more um, as a result. Um, you know, who regulates what? Okay, so for energy infrastructure, you have to, you have to like dive into who actually has, you know, the power to approve things. You know, what's the role of the private sector? Um, there are a lot, you know, and what are the different players doing? So um, there's a, been a push to, um, put in um, offshore wind. Um, there are a couple of uh, leased areas off of Long Island. Um, and the idea is that once you know either one of those gets developed, then it can start coming into the city itself. Um, that's like years down the road. But you know the process that I was involved in was very when I was with the city of New York was very much towards, you know, let's promote, let's look at where can the energy be generated, where can renewables be generated, because we know they can't be generated within the city itself. And you know, what are the closest places? What are the sort of areas of least resistance to bring them in? And you know, offshore wind is a very viable one uh, for New York. <laughs> There's also, for New York State, there's also um, two very important state agencies, New York Power Authority, as well as um, NYSERDA, which is New York State Energy Research Development Authority Agency. Um, NYPA is, in effect, the um, sort of overall utility for many municipalities in New York State. And so they have a tremendous amount of um, power and a tremendous amount of, of ability to influence how energy is generated and how it goes to cities. So it's, a, it's an important partnership between cities, not New York City necessarily, although that it's true too, but particularly the smaller and mid-sized cities who get their energy from NYPA uh, because they can work together on these. Um, NYPA also helps the small and mid-sized cities on energy efficiency, um, energy efficiency initiatives. Um, other things, you know, like who owns the transportation system, what's the deal, who can actually set up the bike lanes, who can actually do the rentals, you know, for or the shared bike system, you know, where's the gridlock, who, you know, has the budget. Um, there are, you know, in Chicago, there's a regional authority that deals with transportation um, that's, that's in strong partnership with City of Chicago and some of the other county governments. New York, it's, it's much more complicated. Um, okay. Another key thing is that the city as uh, a market maker. So cities have a tremendous amount of buying power, and this is true, you know, particularly in things like energy, um, but it's true in lots of other areas as well. So a city can say, you know, we want to find um, all EV electric buses, for example. A city can do things like issue requests for information or requests for proposals to the private sector to find out what can the private sector do in order to fill this gap. And the private sector is all too willing, by and large, to step up and to say, okay, how can we pull this together? How can we get more business you know, from doing that? So it's really important for cities to look at their procurement processes and you know, take advantage of, um, of that. Um, some of you who are a little older may remember the Brady Bunch 
and Jan Brady always saying to Marsha, 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 Marsha. So I always think of that when I go like data, data, data. I mean, it's just important. Um, so, <laughs> so another thing too with cities that you, and this is wildly, this varies wildly among cities, is what is the capacity that they have to collect accurate and meaningful data. New York City is pretty robust on this. It has a long tradition of um, being data oriented. I think to some degree that comes from Wall Street um, and their focus on getting you know, indicators and data and so forth. So it's I think partly a cultural thing. Other cities I know don't have, just from you know, talking with them, don't have the same thing. So it's important to see what the gaps are. And I think that's where, um, in large part, universities and colleges and think tanks can really step up and, and help meet that. But it's important for that to talk to folks in the city and you know, NGOs and so forth to figure out you know, like where are these um, gaps. You know, look at, you know, talk to community members. Are these assumptions right? Are they, you know, are we going in the right direction? What are the priorities? Because sometimes people who live there have way different priorities from, you know, what people think they should. And then also do the numbers add up? Um, okay, I'm gonna try to whiz through the rest of this because um, I know I don't have so much time, but um, okay, four visions. This is how we approached uh, one NYC, our long-term sustainability plan. So we had these visions and then we use them also as lenses. So um, for example, just an equitable city, we would apply that lens to the um, goals and the initiatives that were in growing, thriving city, sustainability, and so forth. We would, we would apply sustainable city, those, you know, that lens to the other programs and the rest of it. And part of it was, you know, can we find the co-benefits here? And are we missing anything? Is there something in here? And in addition, is there something here that contradicts you know, our goals in the other ones and how do we change that? So it's, it's a really, it was a, an effective system for um, New York. It was, it, I mean, it was hard to figure out when we started it, but now it's, you know, sort of ingrained in a lot of um, how the city does its um, decision making. I'm just gonna focus on one example, which was under our sustainable city. So we had this, our overall vision is New York City will be the most sustainable big city in the world and a global leader in the fight against climate change. And so everything tiered off of that within, you know, this vision and this goal. So just looking at the um, GHG emissions, you can see on the left side, the sources of energy on the right side, you can see the output. So you can see from here, again, this is a, to the importance of data, you can see that natural gas makes up a huge amount of the input. Coal is very little, and renewables are also very little. And on the right side, you can see that buildings make up, um, the buildings and the sources of energy that go into them make up the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions. We did a technical working group report. There were a, about 100 or so stakeholders who were involved in the technical working group, and this was a very comprehensive analysis of buildings, because that's where we figured, you know, let's start there, that's a 70% number. Um, one of the things that we found, though, in, again, the importance of data, was that you can't, we, could, we couldn't get to the 80 by 50 goal, which Mayor de Blasio established, reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. We couldn't get to the 80 by 50 goal based only on buildings, nor could we get to it based only on clean energy. So both of them had to work together in order to achieve goals. We found that it was commercial multifamily buildings that are the greatest uh, GHG contributors, even though the majority of the buildings were really the smaller buildings. And so the idea was, okay, if we're gonna look at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, let's just go straight off first for you know, these buildings that have the most impact. Big surprise as we did this, was that we found that heating and hot water were actually the biggest contributor towards greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. We thought it was going to be electricity, and it wasn't. So electricity is the biggest one for commercial buildings, you know, and because of the summertime, AC and so forth. But, you know, really that's not the, that's not the, the key driver for it in New York City. So then that led us to look at, well then, if that's the case, then what do we do for cities? Uh, or what do we do for buildings themselves? And we came up with the different pathways and different um, priorities and so forth. So, you know, with the data, kind of now what, right? So the process then became, okay, we've got, we sort of understand the bigger picture, we think, and so let's drill down into these, 
you know, smaller areas and let's really figure out like how, what are the drivers and what are the different variables in this. There's an update to the greenhouse gas inventory every year. There's, new, there's been um, new proposed legislation, some of which has been enacted already. There are hearings, lots of negotiating. It's, it's very labor and time intensive. Will it work? We don't know, but I think with the, you know, um, the uh, focus on, you know, sort of uh, gathering the metrics and looking at the indicators and, you know, regular updates and, and the transparency on that, um, you know, we'll be able to find out and adjust. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's a web. We're kind of all making this up as we go along um, when, it, when it comes right down to it. Cities can do a lot. Um, on this, they're not, they can't do all of it. It's, you know, it's a bit like the buildings. It's not just getting renewables. It's not just building energy efficiency. You have to have these things all work together. Um, and on, we were talking last night about um, Hamilton, and, you know, it reminded me that, so I have, I have two teenage daughters, one of whom is incredibly obsessed with the musical. And so for a period of time, we were listening to this, you know, the, the musical, like, on this continuous loop at home. And so, you know, but one of the things that stuck, and I, and I love it, but one of the things that stuck with me is that there's a lyric from it that's, you know, look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. And I think that that is actually really true for this. We're in this time of great transition, but there's also great opportunity. There are many, many unknown variables, and it's, a, it's actually a very creative time, I think, in this. And so, to the, to the extent that we can focus on that and to look at like how do we creatively you know solve these things what's the what are what are the gaps in the data I think that you know by and large cities and states will be in um, pretty decent shape on this so thank you Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to um, join you and share with you some perspectives I've gained on living at the water's edge. So I want to put this up and I'll put it up again at the end as uh, future discussion points as well. I really want to spend some time drawing out this analogy between cities and islands. I want to talk to you about coastal effects. Um, heat waves, heat islands, and mitigating factors such as sea breezes. I want to tell you some work we've been doing on storm surge and hydrology as joint stressors on urban infrastructure in our region. Um, share with you some recent research on increasing trends in precipitation for the area. And um, really something I've been thinking a lot about lately is the role of highly integrated coupled earth system modeling um, unified across a bunch of different time scales to really contribute to the science of, um, of, of the changes our planet is undergoing. I want to close with some um, thoughts about science input to resiliency, getting back to this civic organization I work with, the Waterfront Alliance, and some recent efforts they've been undertaking to connect science with neighborhoods, um, and then um, some ideas they've had on design criteria. So let's jump in. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time working on the, on the science of urban meteorology, um, specifically focused in coastal environments. And um, my work has entailed looking at how winds flow around buildings using very detailed building resolving models. You see that on the bottom left. Um, I've been involved in field campaigns at the urban scale um, for observation and modeling. Um, as well as working a lot on islands in diverse locations across the planet. And again, looking at through an observational lens as well as modeling um, coastal and air-sea interaction around islands. And what I'd like to draw out is this analogy between cities and islands because they, they both concentrate populations, they both tend to demonstrate a broad range of microclimates, and hazards associated with the, those variabilities. Um, they expose their populations to enhanced risk. They represent key urban sustainability challenges as well. And these encompass anywhere from extreme rainfall, flooding, as we all have seen in our local area, 
Um, islands are particularly plagued by um, fires, um, and cities and islands both experience air pollution. Um, there's also the coastal vulner vulnerability to, to storm surge, which is a real, real key um, challenge for cities as well as islands. And of course, we can take that even analogy even a, a step further in, in terms of making that analogy more concrete. One of the questioners this morning mentioned urban heat islands. Indeed, we do draw that connection between um, cities and as heat islands. This is some work that a PhD student of mine completed um, looking at the role of heat islands um, and the interaction with the coastal urban environment and the ways that sea breezes can mitigate urban heat island evolution. So the cities retain heat um, over, overnight. You can measure it as the difference between the temperature in the suburbs and the urban areas. And that's the urban heat island. It's me measured in degrees C. It's typically a couple of degrees C for cities, but it can vary depending on the city and the time of year. The, um, it's a demonstrated phenomena across all cities, and it's um, particularly complicated for coastal cities because of the way it varies diurnally day to night due to the prevailing wind conditions. So my student had previously shown that um, in these, these two different um, heat island events, extreme heat, heat island combined with extreme heat events. The top one is uh, an event that occurred in June. The bottom one is an event that occurred in July. And she had looked at the, the heat imprint and how that evolves over the, the several days of these um, extreme heat events that superimpose on an urban heat island. But what she, what she was focused on here is the way that models can resolve the mitigation of that heat island by sea breeze. And what she found is that the Navy's coupled coastal air-sea prediction system that I helped develop when I was at the Navy, so we brought that with us as a prediction tool, run down to one kilometer resolution, did a better job of capturing that land-sea gradient of uh, high winds over the ocean due to the lower um, surface roughness over the ocean. So you see the reds are very strong winds compared with the blues over land. By contrast, a coarser resolution model, in this case she was looking at the 12 kilometer, and at that time the highest resolution model available from the National Weather Service for our region, um, was not able to capture that land-sea gradient that was really crucial for um, representing the sea breeze effects in urban areas. And you can see that in, even with more clarity by noting that those white lines on both of those figures are the observed winds. So the observed winds were much stronger over water and that agrees with observations and you do see a, a prominent land-sea gradient. What it took in order to capture this um, was not just representing the, the land-sea gradients um, in the model, but also to do an urbanized uh, representation um, or what's called an urban canopy parameterization for this mesoscale meteorological model. Um, so I'm just going to tell you briefly a little bit about that parameterization and what it encompasses. So it, what, it, what it takes account of is, is the fact that there's anthropogenic or city contributions to heating as well as the generation of turbulence in urban areas that impacts the atmosphere. And so that's represented in the model by giving it the defined building heights from a city. So you see a, a transect here going from north to south that encompasses the very tall buildings that uh, occur in Midtown as well as in Lower Manhattan. So we're, we have an interesting um, city morphology that we do have two very defined um, regions of tall buildings. Other cities might just have a central urban core, but our, our New York City is, is unique in this regard, and it's all surrounded by water, which makes it unique as well. So um, this type of parameterization improves the prediction of the, the, the meteorological phenomena around cities and has allowed us to get down to um, on the order of 300 meter resolution to resolve the urban heat islands and the superposition of extreme heat events. Um, I wanted to do a, a mention of a, a colleague of ours, Jorge Gonzalez at CCNY. Many of you know him. Um, he's been extending this work by working with an, with an urbanized um, version of WARF, the um, weather research forecast model, and looking at much more recent um, extreme heat events and, and interacting with 
with electric power companies as well. So these are, I think, very exciting directions for urban prediction because it really matters. Um, the trends are is that the heat waves will be increasing in all three dimensions that we statistically measure, which are intensity, duration, and frequency. And you can see those trends for the northeast of um, future projections um, minus the average from our, our past. Um, so this is actually one of the main uh, impacts for cities of climate change that, that worries me the, the most are, are the heat waves. And this is a, a prominent topic within the New York City panel on climate change that Cynthia mentioned earlier. And I, I encourage you to um, peruse that report to learn, to learn more about heat wave impacts on our city. And there are, of course, ways to, um, to mitigate that by altering the surface structures of buildings. One of um, Cynthia's colleagues, Stuart Gaffin, works on um, looking at the impacts of green roofs and, and white roofs by modifying the heating contributions to the urban heat island that the urban surfaces are able to contribute. So reducing those through these changes from black gray roofs to greens and, and white roofs and vegetative surfaces because they retain moisture um, because cities are also um, moisture deserts, so we can add more um, water vapor to the cities by um, adding more trees and vegetative surfaces. I want to transition to um, some work that's been going on in, in my team um, at Stevens, uh, led by Alan Blumberg. We are um, a team of researchers that you've probably heard from some of us before. It includes uh, Nikita Georges, Philip Orton, and our recent hire is Firas Saleh, who is a hydrologist. We have been thrilled to have a hydrologist join our team to look at um, coupled linked coastal air-sea river interactions. And um, so one of the things we've been able to build is a coupled prediction system um, you can see that here, that network of rivers for the Hudson River watershed connected to a coastal ocean model that represents the ocean physics and dynamics offshore. And why does this matter? Well, for our purposes, we've been thinking a lot about the built environment and the water infrastructure. What you see on the right are the location of numerous power plants throughout our region, many of them drawing on the water um, flows from the rivers in order to cool the power plants, and then adding back a, a temperature difference or delta to, with, to creating warmer waters in our, in our rivers. The, um, but it's not just power plants, of course, there's, there's lots of different infrastructure, including dams and floodgates, and we've seen our region very susceptible to flooding. So I want to look at a particular case of, of infrastructure impacts to really drive these points home. So we are in a region that has a combined influence of river and um, tidal components coming from, from the ocean. We live in an area that was substantial fraction was tidal wetlands that has been reclaimed to, to some extent or another. This is a highly urbanized watershed with more than two million people in this area that you see on the right. There's a lot of critical facilities, including airports um, and transportation networks. And I want to draw your attention to the Oradell Reservoir, which is the, that white little dot on the, the top part of the, of the map that you see. Because that reservoir, it turns out, is, um, is critical infrastructure and is also very vulnerable. Um, what, what we've been doing is, as I mentioned, connecting a hydrology model with the coastal ocean. But I didn't tell you about the meteorology yet, but that we use 125 meteorological inputs that give us precipitation and rainfall to, to be able to represent the inland flooding that is then modeled by using a hydrology model that then gives the discharge values to the coastal ocean model, which feeds back to the hydrology. So we have this linked coupled system to represent these processes at, at very high resolution on the order of meters resolution um, with telescoping in. So that allows us to do something like this, which is um, on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is an animation that's going to play again. You can see when right there it was that it's maximum flood inundation. So this is a hypothetical scenario of what would have happened if during Hurricane Sandy the Oradell Dam had breached. So this is um, a dam that's 100 years old and it was designed under assumptions of climate stationarity. So it 
represents significant risk to the energy water infrastructure if you would have a dam failure that would occur during a, um, a hurricane or an extreme storm event. And that's what we're able, those types of scenarios we're able to model with this high resolution linked infrastructure. And this um, effort has been led by the, my hydrologist colleague I mentioned, Firas Saleh. And the paper will be forthcoming next month in advances in water resources. So I just want to really bring home that point of the ability to um, anticipate some of these potential failures and show what these impacts might be in order to help drive the discussion and modifications that would be needed to infrastructure to sustain the um, changes that we'll be, be seeing to um, urban areas on the planet. I also want to make the point that the impacts are not the same for every storm. There, there's, there's not just one typical storm that you can look at and say, okay, you know, we're resilient to this, this particular type of storm because it, it occurred and we know what the impacts were and so let's just build resilience to that particular storm. Because the, the flood, flooding imprint, f fingerprints are quite different in this region between Irene and Sandy, both hurricanes. Irene was noted for the dominance of inland flooding produced by precipitation over land. Most of you experienced that. Um, Sandy was known and dominated for the storm surge impacts that, that reached quite far um, upriver. And you can see the very different footprints of, of the inundation that we reproduced with our modeling system. This matters because we're going to see really strong increasing trends in precipitation. The um, climate science special report from the National um, Climate Assessment number four came out a couple weeks ago. And this was just the science part. There'll be an impacts part coming out that Bill was um, one of the lead authors on the Northeast section. So we'll look to him for, for guidance on um, some of the Northeast trends in terms of precipitation. But, you know, really strong messaging here in this report about increases of precipitation that we've already experienced. These are shown here for um, the changes that, we, that we've seen over the last um, uh, number of years in increasing precipitation. I'm going to skip over this one in the interest of time, but this is looking at the um, the fact that it's not just precipitation in general, that heavy precipitation has been on the rise as well. And these trends are set to, to continue. This is from colleagues at INCAR who um, produced a paper in Nature Climate Change um, last year showing a scaling of um, increases in warming um, rates leading to increased increases in precipitation of about 7% per degree Celsius. So I encourage you to look at this report. And if you can see from the map, there's really you know, strong localization within the, north, the re Northeast region, as well as other parts of our country, but the Northeast region in terms of these uh, sorts of precipitation, anticipated precipitation changes. So I want to circle back to the modeling because um, one of the things I feel like, particularly with all the students in the room, where um, your contributions can really matter is um, drawing together these different ways to model and represent the Earth system as a whole. I was part of a National Academy um, study. Our report came out last year on the next generation of Earth system prediction. We were specifically looking at this time period of sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction, which is really right in the middle between weather and climate. And um, we, were, we were looking at it and looking at what it, what it would take to produce a robust prediction capability for our nation, which for in the subseasonal to seasonal or S to S timeframe, which doesn't currently exist right now. Um, so we had a, a, a team of people in the National Academy study from hydrologists to land surface modelers to ice modelers. Um, there were, it was a large tent of scientists. And this was our vision statement for what, what it would take to, to get there. And, really want to emphasize that it is a multidisciplinary collaboration that is required to represent all these earth system processes and in particular the linkage of those components because there's a lot of science to be done uh, around the linkage of these components do you you know do you need to two-way couple the meteorology with the um, ocean or is it enough for some regions just to do a, a one-way coupled feedback? Um, there's some, some key science questions that are still being 
um, researched, and it may just depend on the region that you're at. I focus a lot on coastal areas, and so the, the two-way feedback is very important in coastal regions for air-sea interaction. But um, globally, there's, there's areas where the feedback you could save on computations by, um, by only doing one-way coupling, for example. And these are some of the trade-offs as you look at computational infrastructure, as you look at co computing heading into the cloud, which produces even more op opportunities for computation as we get away from each university having their high-performance computing cluster and faculty arguing over time on those clusters. Um, as we take computing into the cloud, it's a whole new opportunity to rethink how we do linked um, coupled Earth system processes and some of the downstream aspects of those predictions are, of course, looking at, at the impacts and why those Earth system prediction capabilities will really matter. So in terms of the impacts, I want to do a... Um, a brief mention of the organization, the Waterfront Alliance, which now has over a thousand um, groups who have a stake in the New York, New Jersey waterfront, who are part of our alliance. And one of the things Waterfront and Alliance, our group did, uh, came out with over the summer was a harbor scorecard. It's an interactive web tool drawing on the best available science that's, that's really meant to be a community level index um, encompassing flood risk, water quality, and public access. I'll give you just a a brief little tour of it, and I encourage you to go to the website to, to learn more about it and, and find um, specific neighborhoods. So it's meant to be user-friendly, and the dimensions that I mentioned that we draw out are um, coastal flooding, so the purple on the left. There's um, nearly half a million New Yorkers who have a 50% chance of a major flood in their homes by 2060. 41% of those are economically and socially vulnerable populations. Um, healthy, we look at how are the waterways fishable and swimmable. We still have a really big challenge with combined sewage overflow uh, in our rivers in the metropolitan New York City, New Jersey area. The third dimension is open access. Are the waterways accessible for, accessible for people and boats? And we have some statistics for that. I want to conclude that tour of the Harbor Scorecard by um, showing you one particular neighborhood, which is Coney Island in Brooklyn. So this has um, a significant fraction of the population with exposure to um, major floods. So you can see that here, the way this, this particular aspect of the data is visualized, is that inner core, so um, in Brooklyn, the um, Coney Island CB13, shows that um, a large fraction of the population, 50% uh, is vulnerable to uh, flooding, whereas across Brooklyn it's 18% and across New York it's 5%. So a way to sort of, for communities and neighborhoods to understand their risk in relation to other communities and neighborhoods was one of the goals of this Harbor Scorecard. There's 87% um, of those people in Coney Island uh, who are, um, economically and socially vulnerable. And there is across um, Coney Island, Brooklyn, and New York, there's significant risk of contamination um, by um, toxic industrial chemicals at those sites. So, so really trying to drive home some of these numbers and make them relevant on the community neighborhood scale. And I'd really enjoy speaking more with you all about this. I know there's probably other groups gathering similar types of data and um, how we can leverage all of this to, to make it more impactful at the community neighborhood level. Last point is um, the same group, the Waterfront Alliance, was motivated to start developing waterfront edge design guidelines. Um, so it was inspired by the LEED certification developed for green buildings. It's a menu of best practices for all types of, of waterfront and working with um, a bunch of different stakeholders to, to um, create these um, credits around certain types of buildings, residential, commercial, as well as parks, industrial, and maritime, and seven different um, dimensions where the, the building designs and integration with the environment could get credits. There's just a case study that shows you, um, you know, green space, waterfront access, lots of processes related to the design of the building and where it's situated on the waterfront. And um, I think I'm short on time, so I'm just going to go to the key points again and um, put those up there. And really want to to make the point that 
I think the community engagement around the science and putting, bringing the science down to the level of the neighborhood and the communities is really where we're at. It's where we're at with what Cynthia mentioned on the New York City panel on climate change, and it's uh, where we're at in terms of communicating with, with the public about the science. And I also think that will drive attitude changes around climate change as well when we can bring it down to the community and the neighborhood question, neighborhood level. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for your attention. So um, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, thanks to Marjorie and to Robin and to everyone else who's organized it. And uh, even in this building, I was a grad student uh, here in the 1980s. And uh, it was, uh, we called this sort of moon base alpha. There was, the trees were much smaller, although the buildings were here. And I, I'm starting to smell that smell. You know, you have flashbacks when you smell things. And I, I think lunch is starting to come into the room or something. And I remember lots of uh, um, pieces of pizza of various ages and uh, um, sort of undercarbonated Coca-Cola uh, sort of uh, highlighting my experience in this building um, throughout, for many years. Um, so what I want to talk about is obviously something that you know, reflects the themes of the day, um, also kind of connects to some of these larger questions. Um, and, and Robin alluded to this a little bit. One of the things that... Um, I somehow came into is that I'm involved in this IPCC uh, report on 1.5 degrees, which comes out of the, the Paris Agreement. And the bottom line from that statement is that there's an ambition to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius and then toward 1.5 degrees. So this report is basically asking the kind of question, what would that world look like and is that world possible given the current rates of uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and, of course, the story is mixed. The, there's a long, you know, issue here. But the bottom line is that uh, we are somewhere around 0.9 degrees um, already warmed from the 19th century baseline. And given trajectories, you know, somewhere in the 2030s, we'll hit that number. Um, and, of course, the prospects, you know, even with um, uh, moderate reduction, you know, the warming will be much greater. Right? And so that has sort of significant implications for the globe and um, other sort of contexts. Uh, and particularly in the issue here of the idea of extreme events. Right? There's a gradual shift that we'll see, but also this sort of punctuated moments when we start to see the implications of some of this change in terms of potentially you know, more extreme um, storm events, uh, greater precipitation events, um, and a range of other things, increased droughtiness in particular contexts, increased hydrologic variability, but of course it will also augment some of the initial profiles of, um, of some of the hazards we've seen. Sea level rise, of course, is a great example that storms will occur, but of course that environmental baseline in which all the cities were built is now increasingly dynamic. This is notion of non-stationarity. So cities were built with a certain assumption about what the, the coastline would be like or even the size of and the frequency of precipitation events, and they were engineered that way, and now we have to start to revisit all of that. Now, the other thing, of course, that's a challenge. Now, what's the opportunity? What's the solution space? Well, it was also alluded to by the dean at the very beginning that we are in an urban, we're on an urban planet, and we're going to be increasingly so. And I always reflect on this when I, you know, rattling around in the New York City subways and then people say, well, New York is kind of like a greenish place. You can get along with, you know, low carbon footprint. Well, why is that? Well, I mean, one of the things, of course, is the subway. And the subways were built, for the most part, in the early 20th century. There's some construction going on now. They were built and engineered um, by people born in the 19th century, the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1860s. So the legacy and the opportunity for sustainability today in 2017 is really building on the back of their labor, you know, now 140 years on. The issue, of course, is that we don't have that window, that, that sort of long chunk of time to sort of implement, you know, decision-making processes to affect sustainability in the future. But the opportunity here is that we are rapidly increasing the size of the urban footprint in the, in the world. And that it's over those next couple of decades, as we approach 1.5 degrees, we'll also 
be building cities, many, many cities. And the idea is that if we can integrate sustainability, planning, design, questions that um, promote what is now being called in the context of IPCC land, you know, climate resilient, sustainable development pathways, um, there's opportunity for meeting this 1.5 goal and also promoting sustainability and issues of equity and all the other kinds of things. So, so that's the sort of the charge. And of course, it's also the rebuilding that has to take place of places like New Jersey. New Jersey obviously was, I always re remember as a grad student here, like, when did sprawl start? When was this a big political issue? Well, guess what? You can look back in the records. 1940s, it was like a major issue. We've got to do something about sprawl in New Jersey. Um, you know, maybe it's slowly petered out in the year 2017, um, but these issues emerge and then they get integrated into the decision-making process. So why, why this preamble? Well, one of the kind of the telescoping moments that I see in terms of opportunities for action in the context of climate change are extreme events. They are sort of this kind of first uh, wisp, wind, uh, if you will, of the potential and, and impact of climate change. And in some ways, they alert decision makers, practitioners, stakeholders to some of the issues, as well as residents. And I think one of the things that I've been interested in, um, uh, starting with uh, you know, guidance from Ken Mitchell and others um, uh, in the geography department here, is this idea of how to think about extreme events, where do they emerge from with respect to society, what are some of the vulnerabilities. But increasingly, I sort of look to this question, well, how to think about them in terms of encouraging um, uh, opportunities for policy shifts. So hence, hence my, my focus. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of this sort of a little bit of a ramble to sort of talk about extreme events, a little bit about how we've started to look at this in the context of some opportunities for proactive climate adaptation and larger scale resiliency issues, as well as transformation, what are some of those challenges, and then some like nuts and bolts sort of uh, tools and things that we're experimenting with or at least starting to put together. So I just want to mention this comes from um, lots of different sort of, uh, you know, co you know co collaborative efforts and so forth, and I, I uh, thank all of those that were involved. Um, so let me sort of talk a little bit about extreme events and um, uh, urban systems. We know, that, of course, that the infrastructure of cities, the, the, the bits and pieces, are all built with certain specifications to sort of withstand extremes. You know, every sewer grate, you know, is okay, so it's gonna rain X amount, all right, that's fine, the sewer grate can handle it. If it doesn't, well, then maybe we're gonna have some street level flooding, but we can sort of do something else to sort of manage that as well. There are a range of these different kinds of effects and, and implications, everything from uh, extreme precipitation events, um, extreme heat issues, we've heard about this, sea level rise with respect to storm surge, and of course, um, increased wind events, uh, or, or, or wind events as well. Some of this is sort of well illustrated, you know, in the current climate trends. Um, some of it also is connected to um, some climate projections. But cities have, have recognized, have been built up around these things already. Um, the question is, how do these things change over time? Um, and what maybe new hazards emerge that um, that we didn't necessarily consider in particular places. And of course we recognize that the climate change issue isn't for the future, it's obviously um, embedded in us now. And if we look, but in that simultaneous sort of issue of, of the current, we can also look in the past. And of course every history has its, um, or every city has its history of extreme events, the implications, the policy shifts that, that took place potentially from them. And we can look at many different examples of that. New Brunswick has had its history, um, larger city of New Jersey, New York City, every venue has that. And if we start to look at this question of, of climate change, we sort of recognize, well, there's going to be lots of interesting interconnections that are, uh, most importantly, obviously, is we're changing some of the, those environmental baselines and gradually shifting the average annual temperatures, but we're also starting to see questions about, you know, increasing uh, frequency of, of heat waves, meaning sort of, you know, accelerated uh, or um, uh, days above a certain threshold, or maybe even the potential for larger scale heat waves than we've ever seen before. And this sort of gradual shift with this sort of punct the opportunity for punctuated change is sort of something embedded in the sort of connection between extreme events 
and climate change. And of course, one of the kind of benchmarks of this, there was a, um, I sound like an advertisement for IPCC here, there was the SREX report uh, 20, uh, 2012, which looked directly at this kind of question and tried to sort of start to imagine what that overall distribution, uh, the distributional shifts of these extreme events might look like. Of course, the simple logic in the upper uh, left, I guess, in your, in your viewing, um, is that, well, maybe there'll just be a displacement of, of extreme events. You know, we'll have fewer, um, you know, cold events or cold snaps or whatever sort of metric you want to use, and then on, it'll shift over to, uh, to the right with more frequent heat events and, and heating events or, or extreme heat events. But in reality, some of the, the uh, observed data as well as some the projection data doesn't necessarily sort of speak to those kinds of questions. So it's, it's an issue that's still... Um, evolving. And I think, you know, Cynthia raised this issue of Hurricane Sandy and was it a tipping point and the issues kind of embedded within that. I think it was in some ways a tipping point specifically with this issue in the context of extreme events. Because, I mean, for hazards folks, for people who deal with disaster risk uh, recovery issues, emergency response, there's always like, what do you do? Okay, there's something bad has happened. Let's figure out why that bad thing happened. And then figure out, well, what are, what's the trend? Has, has this have these bad things been happening in the, in the, in the past? Um, are they becoming more frequent, i.e. flooding or, or whatever kind of environmental hazard you might want to think about? Um, and of course, the, the critique has always been the emergency management response to the last disaster. Right? But I think what's happened in, within the context of Hurricane Sandy is a sort of a different picture. And th in this case, what people are starting to ask, yes, what happened? What's the trend? But what is the future condition? So, it, it, so environmental hazards and extreme events are no longer seen as just discrete acute events, but part of a larger chronic process of climate change and the eventual emergence of a variety of different new contexts for, for extremes. Now, if you start to look at you know, the connection, and there's a rich, you know, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to touch on it and then sort of move on because I think it's worthy of introduction. This issue of urban lifelines and, and, and infrastructure connected to um, uh, extreme events obviously is fantastically com complex. We have built amazingly complex urban systems that are highly integrated and in many ways um, are, are tightly coupled in the context of what um, you know, others have called uh, um, Perrault's work on normal accidents, this idea of interconnectivity sparking issues that we hadn't really assumed or thought about um, previously. And in some ways, Sandy kind of illustrated that point, where with multiple cascading failures setting off issues that we hadn't really imagined with respect to disaster uh, response. Um, and what that sort of portends is this issue as extreme events become more complex, and dynamic in the context of an ever more urbanizing world, we have to start to sort of look at what these interconnections and look at opportunities for addressing them. You know, there's a lot, of course, on ecosystem-based adaptation issues. There's a heavily in, in, in increased interest in smart cities and data-rich, some of the things we've already um, heard a lot about before. And of course, in some ways, we still don't really fully understand what are some of the vulnerability issues embedded in a complex urban fabric as well. We saw these sort of multiple issues of, of vulnerability playing out um, in Hurricane Sandy. The other thing, of course, to remember is that extreme events and impacts um, Someone else has always sort of, uh, I think this is Susan Cutter's, uh, one of her lines is that an extreme event doesn't necessarily mean an extreme impact. Others have said it, I just heard her say it most recently. Um, and, but it's a very you know, profound and simple point that it's really in some cases a game of inches. The flooding that knocked out lower Manhattan, literally, I mean, Con Ed knew that, you know, yeah, there's going to be storm surge. They had built something for the storm of record. It was 12 feet or so. This previous storm of record was 10 and a half feet. Guess what? Sandy was about a foot and a half higher, a game of inches, right? And also this issue of interconnecting climate change onto this game of inches because as the baseline starts to shift, we have that possibility of more, more flooding um, as a simple example of this, this graphic, which illustrates some of these large uh, storm events, their, um, their height, their potential for flooding, and that uh, dark blue line in the middle is that, uh, uh, the, that sort of uh, anthropogenic sort of um, sea level rise dimension that we've started to see in the signal of sea level rise in the New York metro region. And of course, if you telescope your eye back and forth on that, you'll see that some of those past events in the context of 
current and even future sea level rise will mean they potentially could be uh, flooding events as well, and we need to sort of recognize that. So let me sort of you know, shift from extreme events, bad things. You know, what does that mean in terms of um, risk management? And one of the things, the, the graphic that um, the New York City panel on climate change have used very effectively, we stole it from London, we made it better. Like all good New Yorkers, we decided we, decided we created it, but someone did it first. Um, it's this diagram. It's basically asking a very simple question. If there's an acceptable level of risk in a particular context, you know, what can adaptation do in terms of responding to that? And, the, and the, um, the blue and the red lines illustrate if we do nothing uh, with some simple um, greenhouse gas em emissions reduction, sort of um, dampening the effect of, of future climate change. And those other, the, the green, and the, uh, 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 green and yellow lines illustrate this uh, opportunity of having a more flexible response as science becomes available and taking on um, new action. And for me, um, my question is, well, what happens when that line changes? Why does that line change? Who decides that line changes? What's the impact? Does it happen after an extreme event? Right? Of course, that's a simple sort of argument, but it's my logic in sort of some of this work that we can use extreme events as we know it's going to be this sort of you know, foreshadowing of these sort of larger questions of climate change as an opportunity to accelerate response. And so I'm looking at these particular inflection points. There's a lot of words and things to sort of think about here. The issue of resilience, which is this sort of capacity to withstand a shock. But I think cities are also starting to look at this question of transformation, where even within the context of engineering guidelines, it could be that they can no longer, they can make those systems more resilient, enhance their resiliency, but in some cases, the cities might decide we might to th need to think about a new system, something different, um, and that's the concept of transformation. And that shift from one state to another, I would define as, as transition. And there's a lot of rich literature in complex you know, systems theory and so forth. Martin Sheffer and others have talked about this sort of notion of when these potential system transitions in the physical context could occur. A lot of my interest, and some others are looking at it as well, is how this plays in social science context or social context, and particularly in the policy domain. And some of my thinking on this really gets you know, kind of cemented when I look at quotes like this for some of our work, asking um, uh, local decision makers for New York you know, what, you know, how to sort of understand the future with respect to climate change and what are some prospects um, to respond. And the bottom line of this quote is like, we have a lot of data, we have a kind of a sense of it, but we really don't have the capacity to act. We don't really know what to do yet. Um, and there's discussion in, in the formal settings, there's a lot of discussion on the sidelines. And I think what we're starting to see is this real interest and, and need um, amongst the stakeholders and decision makers, practitioners, to try to figure out some of those pathways moving forward. So this has set in motion, at least in my own work, some questions about what is the connection between extreme events and some of these sort of policy shifts that, that take place. When, um, when and how do disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation shifts occur? Uh, under what conditions can transformative adaptation occur? And again, going back to my 1.5, we need transformative adaptation and transformative mitigation. Obviously, I'm not talking too much about mitigation at the moment. Um, so there is a knowledge base, and, you know, there's lots of literature going back through the 1970s about um, policy entrepreneurs and policy windows and, and, and the like. And in some of the work that, that we've been doing, we're sort of looking at, you know, either both a, a, a general assessment and some more specific uh, project work, as, um, along with uh, uh, Robin Lashenko and some of her grad students, looking at responses from um, Hurricane Sandy um, in, um, in Raritan Bay. You know, there is a sort of a, a consensus. The size and extent of the disaster, the loss and damage experience does sort of influence this, the discussion and possibility of change. This notion of future and expected hazards, of course, is important. I didn't uh, note it here, but certainly policy entrepreneurs and sort of you know, ready and easy solutions also comes up. If you start to look at you know, more immediate kind of community context, it's also this sort of networking. What are other people in the community, whether it be a residential community or a decision space community, what are they doing? Um, what are the institutional and legal frameworks for adaptation? And we heard uh, great comments from uh, Nilda in terms of the capacity of cities to act or not act. And of course, I think embedded in this is also the role of science. Um, certainly I'm biased from the, the efforts with the NPCC, but I think in many other contexts, 
good science does contribute to significant advances in policy making. Um, and then last thing, there are these sort of sets of contextual factors that reflect the nature of a place, the history of the place, the sector and sort of composition of the issue that you're looking at, as well as the proximate conditions. And that's, I'll talk about that as well in a moment. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that while we, we feel like we're adrift in this question of climate change, I think I want to make a strong point that we are deeply embedded in the history of the development of cities. Cities didn't begin, you know, in this century. They've been around for thousands of years. They have solved, they have, they have faced stresses, they have fa faced, you know, existential crises, and they have somehow responded and still exist today. And so what, is, what are some of the lessons learned from that? This is a little kind of tableau of like some of the issues for New York City, but there are many, many other, every place has that history or else it wouldn't exist as it does today. So what I want to do is just to close off with, I know uh, we want to get to some Q&A, um, is just a little bit of some other things that we're doing, things that we're thinking about. I'm going to clip through these quickly. Um, I've highlighted some of this already and then I'll end off with, with a couple things and then um, I'll shut up. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I, I really kind of helped me advance my thinking, this was some work that I did with Mark Pelling and uh, Matthias Gershagen, um, it, it came out in Ecology and Society, on this sort of a conceptual model of the adaptation transition and the building, of, um, uh, adaptation transition, and that, which led to some dis discussion about building a support tool. Again, this is sort of like maybe kind of, you know, socially sciencey. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, in this context, it's, it's reflective of case studies. There's no, there's no um, you know, it's extensive empirical analysis. But what, what the literature speaks to is this process through which transitions from one decision uh, paradigm or one sort of risk management paradigm to another take place. And what we're trying to do is to highlight some of the conditions under which these transitions from one paradigm, one of resistance and engineering, to resilience, which is more the contemporary um, paradigm and a lot of urban space, to this idea of transformation. And what are the contexts that would be, um, that, that are associated with each of those, uh, um, we, with the, with each of those transitions. We talk a lot about that, though, those different types of drivers and their, 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 um, how, how they interact. And we started to look at some of this in the context of a case study for Jamaica Bay and what the kind of the context for um, risk management was before Hurricane Sandy and what kinds of shifts occurred in the um, immediate aftermath of the several years um, after that. I can highlight this a little bit more later on. But embedded in sort of focusing in a little bit more, and this, this, the talk gets you know, more and more focused here, um, is this idea of like, what changes? Why do you see policy uh, issues emerging? And why do these sort of shifts take place? And one of the things we sort of have been starting to look at more, more recently is this idea of the discourse system. How the questions of, of, of interest groups, um, the belief systems, the attitudes, the, the ongoing practices, how do they inter intersect in the context of a discourse system and when do you see shifts taking place where the, that discourse system itself might move or, or at least encourage a shift from policy, from one policy regime to another. And of course, one of the things that's come up in a lot of this discussion, it's not always like the big event, of course. It could be multiple events that could, you know, precipitate yuck, yuck, um, a, um, an issue of policy change. So the nuisance flooding, is that going to become equivalent to an extreme event? Or even dislocation, spatial dislocation. We know that post-Hurricane Sandy, New York got clobbered, New Jersey got clobbered, et cetera. Baltimore really woke up. Boston woke up. They all sort of looked at what happened in New York and New Jersey as examples of what to avoid, and that spurred a lot of interest in activity and policy discussions. So more recently, we've been looking at this idea of trying to create a topology of different kinds of connections between the resilience of the discourse system and the size of the extreme event and the implications and how that, how that transitions um, might take place in the context of a policy regime shift. We're then translating this information, this is the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll go through, into what we describe as decision support tools. There's a, a whole host of decision support tools under the context of extreme events. They're generally fairly large. What we're trying to do is to develop some, what we'd call boutique, very specific you know, engagements at specific moments. One that we're really focused on a lot is this idea of health, a post-event learning tool. And to embed it in that period with, from a disaster response 
to that longer term recovery process where learning from the event can be enhanced and promoted in a, in a many tiered process um, to sort of see whether or not that becomes this opportunity for accelerating the integration of climate information into the recovery process. And I know I'm running out of time. Um, if anybody wants to follow me to Brooklyn, actually, no, Lower Manhattan, we're doing a PELT beta test this afternoon, which is where I, I need to go soon after. Um, but it is in the development stages with a set of um, uh, stakeholders. And the idea would be to, to roll this out as a larger tool that could then be employed, um, not in the immediate aftermath, but in the, um, the period six to nine months following an event. And the last thing I'll end off with is sort of what I've tried to do here is to sort of talk about this question of climate change and the window into some opportunities for solution. And for me, we know that extreme events are coming, right? It's part of our future. They are not going to be as they were in the past. They are not going to be as they are currently. They will be something new and different. But in the context of our capacity to understand them, they also become opportunities for us to think about transformative change. And so this is sort of the, the arc of the discussion. Um, and I think that in some ways it provides, at least for my, my own psyche, some ways to engage in this issue. And I think it was mentioned already, Cynthia mentioned it, this is something that we need to do. Um, and I think this is, allows me to do something that I think I need to do. Um, and I'll end off with um, opportunity to participate. We're also developed a post-hurricane, a five-year on, uh, um, online survey, which Marjorie uh, very graciously made some comments to. It is now on a survey monkey, um, and if you uh, are feel so excited, it's specifically targeted for practitioners and decision makers, but you know, if you want to get in there, maybe you can do that. Um, but it's really asking this question, you know, not so much if you were like, you know, in the bullseye in New Jersey or New York from Hurricane Sandy, but these areas from outside. And what, what was the influence of the extreme event in one locality on your decision making very distant away? And I think that's, those lessons coming out of this survey will also help in, at least from my perspective, accelerating this integration of extreme events into our understanding of, of climate adaptation. And I'm going to stop. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you. That was an excellent panel, excellent set of panel talks. And um, so what we'd like to do now for maybe about 15 minutes or so is I'm going to pose a couple of questions to the panel and just to kind of get each of their response and sort of, you know, in theory and hopefully get the panel talking to each other a little bit. And then following that, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience as we did last time. And then we'll we're going to try to close it up, close it up by 12:30. So we're, we're at, I see lunch is back there and people are hungry. I know. Um, so I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'm going to just tailor it down to just I think probably just maybe two at most three. Um, so one of the things that is really striking about working in cities, and this is really p kind of parallel to our climate institute itself, is a very very interdisciplinary pace, place. We have scientists, we have social scientists, we have people in policy, we have engineers, we have sort of the whole spectrum of people. And so I want to start out with a question in terms of working in cities and to ask the researchers to reflect on kind of this idea of interdisciplinarity and in particular as a social scientist working with, a, with natural scientists or natural scientists working with social scientists, what do you see as sort of um, maybe some reflections or some sort of maybe lessons or suggestions or opportunities that you might identify in, in terms of that question of you know, working effectively in an interdisciplinary setting. So if, if, we, if each of you guys would be up for responding to that one. Um, sure. Sorry. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I still remember when I was starting out uh, as an academic and there was a, a project uh, it had involved uh, biologists and some um, geographers and a bunch of other folks. And, you know, we, we talked for like a week. And then at the end of the week, we, we realized we were using terms, but we were using them very differently. And so it took like forever to sort of get over that. Um, now, that was a long time ago. I think we've made a tremendous amount of progress. I think that, you know, um, you know specific to your question, that practitioners or academics have come into the, this arena are certainly familiar with their, their recognition that they have to work collaborat collaboratively with others and to engage with that. Um, I think that where it works best, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. 
Trans, in my, my understanding, so basically you come into it almost as a neutral player without you know, your intellectual or academic back, baggage with you. Um, the others are, are more, you, you maintain some of your, your points of engagement. I guess from my perspective, um, it's usually, it works out, obviously it's critical, but it works out best, I think, when people bring um, both their capacity to sort of their, to bring their expertise to the table, but also to, um, to be flexible and to hear what others are saying and to sort of engage and to you know, have part of their being sort of you know, interacting with, with what they're hearing um, across disciplinary lines. So it's in those contexts, I think NPCC serves that. I think other, other venues that I've been connected with serve that, that possibility. So I think that's really the, the best domain. Um, I think this is a really interesting question, but the, um, I, I tend to look at interdisciplinarity in terms of not just amongst um, sort of set disciplines, but also um, amongst people who have access to information that um, academics may not necessarily have access to. So I think it's really important to involve um, you know, communities and to sort of test uh, assumptions on the ground. Um, oftentimes, I think, and this sort of goes along with, you know, the value of citizen scientists in a way. So um, often it's the folks who live in the particular neighborhoods who really have uh, the information that um, folks looking at it from outside those neighborhoods don't necessarily have. So I think that's really critical, and I think it's also critical to look at uh, what are the different, what are the values, like, you know, what's the culture of a place? So um, what are the real priorities in a place? Because I think that can skew how you look at what potential policy solutions may exist. Um, so, you know, is it that it's, you know, is air pollution and asthma, are those like really huge issues for particular neighborhoods, you know, as they are in New York City, as they are in many other places, and to what degree um, does, do the public health aspects affect um, the perception of, uh, you know, other issues that are coming up? So I think it's important to, you know, to really take like a way big step back and to look at um, sort of overall what's going on with the city. To what degree, you know, are people, what, to what degree is there a lot of transition amongst city residents? I mean, like San Francisco, something like um, the average length of city residency is like four years, which is incredibly short compared to other cities where that length is much longer and how does that affect um, different systems in the city? Um, I just had a quick addition to that. Is mine on? Can you hear me? Is it on? Um, yeah, I think it's tremendously exciting, these opportunities for sustained collaboration between the natural, physical, and social sciences. And these opportunities that Bill and Cynthia have been mentioning for drawing together the national and international community, because I think it is that sustained engagement. It's not just the one-off, let's all get together and talk about solutions, but it's the that building of that community. And I think the last point I wanted to make is is particularly around impacts is where the social and natural physical sciences is really can come together and and be much add greater value than than the sum of their parts. Great. Did did any of you guys have any additional comments or based on what anyone else said anyone want to add anything? Technology. So, I think the bottom line is Interdisciplinary work, at least from my perspective, is builds the capacity to address big, big questions, and I think it's an, it's an imperative. So that's my Great. simple response. Okay. All right. So let me let me just pose another question. Um, so we've had a lot of the word opportunity has been used throughout the day, and um, one of the things that was really a striking theme among all the panels was. This, this connection with New York City and how successful in terms of, you know, sort of the, the, you know, the model building, the action, the sort of engagement with climate change that New York City has, has undergone over this past decade and how much it's actually really been able to do. And in New Jersey, we, you know, we've been sort of jealous for about eight years because we felt like we didn't have that sort of opportunity to engage as much with our leadership. And now we have a new governor coming in who um, 
um, the governorship of, of Murphy, which will be potentially, you know, much more open to engaging around climate change. And so I wanted to ask the panelists to sort of maybe, what can, what can you guys tell us as researchers, mostly researchers from New Jersey, about what, what kind of suggestions might you offer for us for really engaging with um, the governorship of Phil Murphy and really, you know, maybe making New Jersey a model for climate change action? Anybody want to start with that one? Um, so just strategically, I would say, you know, get in touch with the transition team right away. Um, it, you know, I think that it, what's especially um, compelling to decision makers is having a sort of uh, a kind of a broad coalition and also having the facts and being able to present ideas for how they can, you know, really solve problems. And so, you know, if you're looking at... Uh, if you're looking at climate potential climate impacts for New Jersey, then you know break it down to what are the kinds of steps that they could actually do. What are the things that they could do that would be effective? You know, so for like New York City, it has to do, you know, to large degree around things like building codes. You know, so what are the levers? What are the what are the things that they could actually do that they can, you know, pull off that will in fact make an impact. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about your question, and uh, you know, one of the things that I would find is that um, you know, New York has obviously done a lot, and which is good, um, but in in many ways, New Jersey is more like the rest of the country, right? Um, and this is maybe like too uh, uh, entrepreneurial, or whatever. But I mean, in my limited sense, decision makers like to be put in a position to be heroes, to do something, to be visionary. So the idea that New Jersey could become a place for you know, experimentation on new technologies associated with a whole host of, of I mean, obviously we see you know, solar panels out here and other kinds of things, but I mean, the issue of climate change is going to be, uh, and is and will be more so, uh, a profound question of societal capacity to respond. And with that, there is a tremendous amount of capacity to make money, right? I mean, that's, that's the connection point, and that if, if the governor and the team sort of sold a, a bill, I mean, a, that you can be a visionary um, administration to sort of create an incubator state that could develop these technologies and approaches and sort of systems and so forth that could then be translated, you know, to other places. I mean, certainly California has like grabbed that, that mantle. There are a few other places. There's no reason why New Jersey can't be the, the East Coast. I mean, um, Franklin talked about New Jersey, Ben Franklin, um, as, a, as a barrel open at two spigots, right? The market of Philadelphia and New York. I mean, New Jersey is right in the, the heart of this sort of huge, you know, urbanized, you know, region. And if it could become a, an entrepreneurial site for these kinds of activities, that would make, you know, the governor would be all excited and, you know, I'm a hero for doing this. Uh, and, but it may mean real uh, formative change. Mm -hmm. So just one follow-up. So Mike Bloomberg's success now as a climate change spokesman for the world is because of his, the ideas of the New York City panel. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, just one quick addition on the physical science side is I think the, the specificity is really important. And, um, Coastal urban areas are really subject to the, the combined inland flooding and storm surge stressors. It really just squeezes coastal areas in a unique way. And where our cities are, they get squeezed by inland flooding and coastal storm surge. This is particularly true of New Jersey. So um, I think that's a, that's a message that would, would carry well uh, into the future. Mm -hmm. Great. So did, any, did anyone want to have any follow-up or response on that one? So I think, given the time, I think we should open it to questions from the audience now. So please um, ask questions. We, as, as our policy is before, to try to get students, try to give that students the opportunity to ask questions first, but certainly anyone is welcome to ask questions of our panel. Um, the map that, that Julie Pollan showed of the flooding area in northern New Jersey uh, after Irene and Sandy, the biggest area was in the vicinity of the Hackensack Meadowlands that used to be a whole lot larger than they are today. Uh, there are towns, Wayne, Lodi, around the Meadowlands. That, that whole area used to be Meadowlands. And the towns were built in the wetland. 
And that's always going to flood. And it doesn't take a hurricane to make those areas flood. I remember year after year, some sort of ordinary storm, and the people are paddling their canoe down Main Street in those towns. So there are places that people just shouldn't be living. And I think one way we could get people more accepting of the idea of moving somewhere else is to never use the word retreat. I think retreat is a red flag that sets people up emotionally that they don't want to retreat. You know, if you said move inland, and I think I, I would strongly, I'm not a social scientist, but I think if we avoid the use of the word retreat, we will accomplish a whole lot more in getting people willing to think about these things. Well, it's, you're right. I mean, retreat is an absolutely loaded word. I mean, you know, Bloomberg in particular, you know, you know, would have no part of that in the context of New York. Um, and this, you know, a lot of discussion about what, what, what is the appropriate way to phrase that. I mean, there is discussion about, in New York, about uh, doing down zoning, you know, which sounds kind of wonkish, um, but it, it also provides opportunity to sort of reduce, you know, density in, in some high uh, profile vulnerable areas. So I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Lintner. I'm faculty here in environmental science. And I guess I, I, I was wondering if you could comment maybe on, from, from sort of the, the university side and educating students, uh, what, what we might need to do better in terms of preparing students, the next generation, uh, to address climate change in cities. I mean, are, are there sort of innovative ways that we might approach this to better, better prepare students to address these challenges? Great question. My, my knee jerk response, I'm a geographer, so getting students out there, seeing it, seeing what, what the implications are, seeing the physical evidence of, um, you know, inundation, increasing, you know, nuisance flooding, what that might mean, or, you know, post-event sort of things. I mean, that to me is something that are, I'm also an educator, and like, that's the thing that students increasingly miss is that real world tangible experience. I, I would um, say that students oftentimes don't understand the link between the economy and sustainability. And so, um, you know, and that's where oftentimes, you know, good intentions meet their death. <laughs> so to the extent, I, I think it's really important for students to understand something about um, economic development, something about growth, something about um, migration patterns, um, and you know, what are the real, from the business side of things, what are the real impacts on business of um, different potential policies, and like how would they, in fact, try to um, implement things? You know, what are their um, incentives? So as you heard, I'm a big proponent of integrated modeling, and I think it's really important um, to train the students not just to, to use these models, but to be able to interpret the models and to understand the limitations. And so even if they're not going to grow up to be modelers themselves, just to, to be able to um, understand the directions that modeling is, is going in and where are the opportunities to develop better parameterizations. Um, I think that's a key linkage between the realms of different sciences that bridges a lot of different sciences. Thanks.